good morning respected doctors my name is nishant i am based at mumbai head office alkem it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to this ent workshop at jaipur arranged by team clavam alkem magna i would like to extend an especially warm welcome to all of you who travel for to be with us today doctor alkem magna has always supported the cause of otolaryngology in india conducting this ent workshop is one such endeavor in the same direction it is a thoughtful program built to cover all aspects of functional endoscopic sinus surgery from molecule level to surgery and its complications so doctors without any further delay let's begin the workshop with inaugural lighting of the lamp and ganesh mantra i would like to request following dignitary to please come step forward for lighting of the lamp may i please request respected dr satish jain sir <coughs> dr dhruva roy sir also from senior leadership of alkem dr mr ranjan ghosh mr omkar debashish to please come forward for lamp lighting <coughs> May I please request Dr. Rajan Bhargav also to please come forward. so now now the time to honor our mentor the brain behind his entire ent workshop the dynamic personality in otolaryngology in india we are extremely happy to have with us respected dr satish jain sir his extraordinary personality does not need any introduction at all a noble man with a great character so ladies and gentlemen i request you all to huge round of applause for dr satish jain sir i welcome and i request mr omkar debashish to please come and welcome dr satish jain sir good morning all first of all welcome to the pink city for this workshop and i know you all are busy guys all practitioners and coming all the way for this basic workshop on sinus surgery is a real pleasure to have you all thank you once again and big thanks to the team alkem magna for once again showing their commitment to the academic endeavors thank you so much to the entire team for organizing this entire setup thank you thank you so much this course can you can you start actually is designed on a very 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 basic topic 
chronic rhinosinusitis. We all know at the time is changing. If you look at the past in otolaryngology, ear surgeries were on top, still on top. And the place for the rhinology surgery was very, very low or very small, I can say. At the time is changing, more and more understanding of the rhinology diseases have come forward. And now, more and more rhinologic surgeries are on place as compared to otologic surgeries. And we all know the big reason behind this, the ear and nose problems are together. They have same pathophysiologic mechanisms and one promotes another like that. More and more treatment of the rhinologic disorders have brought the otologic disorders on the down trend. And this workshop is basically our endeavor to share our experience on this topic of chronic rhinosinusitis. We all know this subject went on a big research in 70s when Messer Klinger and Stamberger started their work on endoscopy and found something revolutionary that all sinuses drain through the ostia into the nasal cavity, not by the gravitational drainage. And that burst in a big way and endoscopic surgery was popularized. But what we have seen over the couple of years, you know, that time the Stemberger was one of the most popular person in the American circuit who introduced this concept of sinus surgery and people started everywhere following him and done thousands of sinus surgery that time. Over a period of year, what we realize, the recurrences. His concept was, you open up the sinuses, establish the ventilation and drainage, and the inflammatory disease of the sinuses will revert back to normal. And it happened. But over the period of the time, the disease again came back. In spite of having all sinus ostium open, in spite of having mucosity activity normal, in spite of that, the disease came back. And so a lot of research work started on this, on understanding this disease. This is not a mechanical disease. Purely medical disease, surgery is the answer. We'll do, I will discuss fine nuances of what exactly this disease is. So aim of this workshop is to share our experience of what has been done on this subject in the last three decades. We have reviewed more than 4,000 publications. I will share with you. You can, uh, I will uh, give to the team LKM and you, anybody wants to have those publications, more than 4,000 publications on this subject, right from the molecular level to surgery and complication, including everything. What has been done as a research work on this subject until now? Besides that, my personal interaction to some of the stalwarts, particularly Professor Stamberger, Professor Richard Harvey, Professor Sethi, couple of times, hours and hours of, you know, discussion on understanding this disease and sinus surgery and so many other things. And our own experience of having done more than now 10,000 cases of sinus surgery at our, at our setup in our span of last 20 years. So this is all the endeavor to share our work, our understanding on this subject with you all to improve, to optimize the treatment of this disease, chronic rhinosinusitis. As it looks like from the name, like an in, infective disorder, this is not infection. This is pure multifactorial inflammatory disease. It has been now very well understood. So this is going to be an interactive session. This workshop is designed in such a way that we can cover all the aspects. Mostly in the workshop, we discuss only surgical aspects. But what we believe without understanding disease, this disease at the molecular level, our surgical understanding and the overall results cannot be better. So we'll start our course with basic understanding of this disease. Decision making, comorbidities, how to deal with that difficult situations, when to operate, when not to operate, the operative details will be discussed in the afternoon when uh, we'll show live surgery. And that will be again from the basics, from the basic cases to the most advanced lobsters and other cases tomorrow. And then finally end with the complications and their management. So the basic and the most important part and the core part of this workshop is understanding this disease at the molecular level. You know, as we have understood, this is an inflammatory disease. Anything, all the drivers which are driving the inflammation, we need to know so that we can define more and more new targets 
to control this disease. This is a medical disease. Co-treatment is medical. Surgery is not a co-treatment. And in times to come, as I'm going to share with you, again, the medical treatment is going to be the co-treatment with hardly any scope of sinus disease in the future, 10, 15 years down the line. This has come out with the recent research work. So to start with the Stamberger's work, what I said, initial treatment for this, what Stamberger and Messerkinder proposed was to open up the sinus ostium. You establish the ventilation and drainage and expect the inflammatory disease to revert back to normal. It is a mucosal disease. And the mucosa reverts back to normal once the ventilation and drainage is established. It is still works. This concept is still works. But the problem is, this is not the disease which can be cleared by the mechanical treatment. And many a times, what surgeons believe, see, this, is a, uh, this presentation is going to be very, very clinical once this understanding starts at the molecular level. And there are certain myths which involves a lot of medical legal problems also in this, you know, management of this disease. So the biggest myth is sinus surgery is the ultimate cure of this patient or the disease. Believe me, this is a medical disease once again and the core treatment is medical, not the surgical one. Yes. Yeah. And actually the treatment starts after the surgery most of the time. This is not a single disease like any other disease. This is a sort of syndrome where we need to look at various aspects which modifies the course of the disease at different levels. Every patient has a different underlying pathophysiological mechanism which need to be understood now. That is what the you know current understanding of precision medicine. Because there are so many variables in the diagnosis in the pathophysiology of this disease and every particular patient needs a particular you know uh, precise treatment. So, traditionally, what we have been doing, why we are gathered here to improve the outcome of this treatment of chronic rhinosinusitis, when it comes to surgery, to improve the outcome of surgical exercise. So, traditionally, what Messerkinder and Stamberger proposed was this one. And now, that concept still stands. But now, since the disease comes back, it has been understood, the, you know, the disease has been understood at the molecular level. The drivers of inflammation have been understood. And it has been proposed that at most of the steps of this disease progression, it is a steroid which works maximum at every level. And the role of this surgery has now changed dramatically. It's not that you remove the disease and get back to the work. You remove the disease and you need to do something to prevent further inflammation, ongoing inflammation, to control that ongoing inflammation. And then this disease gives you, once you open up all sinuses, establish the ventilation and drainage, it gives you access for the topicals to introduce deep into the sinuses. That is the, one of the main goals of sinus surgery nowadays, to introduce topicals deep into the mucosa, into the sinus mucosa, where actually the disease is happening. So it avoids the need of oral steroids in the future, that is one of the biggest, you know, target of sinus surgery or the biggest goal of the sinus surgery in the current times. And most importantly, by means of surgical exercise, you reduce the inflammatory load. What I mean to say, this is a medical disease we all know. What has been taught, the maximum medical treatment is the answer to this problem. You give maximum medical treatment in terms of sometimes antibiotics, steroids, whatever. But you cannot go beyond a limit you cannot continue with the oral steroids for long because of their ongoing you know, side effects, their adverse effects of the oral steroids. So you have to limit your medical treatment at certain limits. And that is defined by the inflammatory load. If some patient has a small inflammatory load can be tackled by the topical steroid, there is no need of sinus surgery. That concept still works. This is just the beginning I'll show. I'll tell you why, what, what I'm saying and why I'm saying. But if the disease load is too much, oral steroid is the need of the time to continue for the long term, which is not advisable, not possible. And then you need to reduce the inflammatory load by means of some surgical exercise and where comes the role of the sinus surgery. So the role of sinus surgery is three-pronged nowadays. Obviously, to establish the ventilation and drainage to maintain the sinus physiology, to bring back the sinus physiology to normal to give access to the topical steroids so that you can avoid the need of the oral steroids in the future. 
and thirdly and the most importantly to reduce the inflammatory load so whatever remaining inflammatory load can be tackled with a minimal topical steroid rather than the need of the oral steroids that is the present goal of the sinus surgery and this see what we expect from a sinus surgery like a patient with a polyposis which is one of the common manifestations for the difficult sinusitis condition sinusitis as i said is a multi you know faceted disease with lot of pathophysiological process lot of endotypes and phenotypes there so this is one of the common thing which we see in our practice the polyposis and the goal of the entire surgery is to achieve this kind of a cavity establish ventilation drainage give good access for the topicals to reach everywhere and here comes the role of surgery or a good surgical exercise to give you a cavity where one the patient himself can introduce the topical steroids into the depth of the cavity and the third one is to bring back the mucosa to normal to reduce the inflammation of the mucosa back to normal to relieve the symptoms that is what the goal of the present you know uh, sinus surgery in the present era now coming to the definition next 10 minutes for the basic and then we'll go with the clinical uh, scenarios this definition is very important the biggest problem why we are gathered here to discuss how to improve the outcome and for that the most important thing is to reach to correct diagnosis diagnosis of crs or the chronic rhinosinusitis is always always clinical never on the basis of any other thing than clinical and most of the time you diagnose by means of one or two major symptoms of crs extending or continuing beyond 12 weeks to label it as a chronic one along with some minor symptoms along with some endoscopic and radiological confirmation it's not like one thing you get a, a ct scan done you some opacity some opacity can be labeled as crs if the symptomatology is not supporting it cannot be crs if you see something in the nose looking like crs and if the symptomatology is not supporting it is not crs so a correct diagnosis is very important to reach to a correct outcome for example the facial pain or whatever is one of the major symptom most of the time even the patient comes to you that i have a sinus pain you get a ct scan you see some opacity you see, you get a 100 patient ct scan and in 10 to 20% you will get some or other opacity labeled as a sinus disease which actually is not a sinus disease so we need to define what exactly that facial pain is corroborating to the sinus disease or something else to label the facial pain for the sinus region or sinusogenic origin it has to be supported by the fact that it the pain is relieved by the medication like antibiotic or steroids and it aggravates with the episodes of viral infection or something or it has to be some endoscopic confirmation of signs like polyp or some prurens or something in the middle meatus or in the nose to confirm that pain to be the sinusogenic so your symptomatology is very important to understand as this disease can be misdiagnosed many a times as a crs and you start operating on a crs for something else because whenever you confirm by means of a ct scan only you will find some or other opacity even in the normal individuals which comes after a small viral episode or could be sometimes persisting for some other past reasons not because of crs so the correct diagnosis is very important you know in general how many crs patient we ent guys are treating pure crs cases less than 10% 10% is even a big number i am telling you majority of these patients are being treated by either gps or general physicians because the symptomatology of these uh, you know crs symptomatology is so overlapping any patient coming with a nasal blockage pain or some cold or some kind of patient always complained of feeling of cold sneezing or something like that and the gps have a habit or the physicians always give a course of antibiotic steroid and some other patient gets relieved ent is what we are get, getting are actually less than less than 10% patients of actual crs and most of the patients are either being treated by the gp or general physician misdiagnosed mistreated and patient keep on taking steroids to control their symptom most often even the homeopath what they give the steroids and the patient gets relieved and because patients have the habit of trying to get up from the surgical exercise to get to allopathic doctors so most of the time it is misdiagnosed and a correct diagnosis is desired to get a correct result and what you can take the help of this scoring this is our preferred method of scoring sinonasal outcome 
score is not 22. This is very, very simple, very important and prevents you from getting, you know, diverted to some other pathology, misdiagnosis from medical legal problems and so on. What to, in the simplified manner, these are 22 symptoms related to the sinus disease, primarily or distantly related to the sinus disease, which a patient can complain of. And in terms of scoring from grading grade 1 to grade 5, for 22, 5 times 110 is the scoring which patient has to score his symptoms. Like for example, why it is important? If you start scoring SNOT 22, your 90% of the problem of diagnosis and other issues can be easily resolved because this is purely patient-centered decision-making. Many a times you have to take decision whether to operate or not. This SNOT 22 will help you as this is always where the patient is involved in the decision-making process. So simply what is, if the patient complains of some symptoms like, I have problem in the sleep. I get up early in the morning. I have problem in the throat. I have some sticky discharge in the throat. Some nonsense. I have headaches. Some X, Y, Z problems which are not related to CRS. You can easily diagnose that this is not the correct diagnosis because ultimately CRS has to be diagnosed on the basis of clinical grounds. If the patient's symptomatology doesn't warrant to a CRS, there is no point in taking forward the case for the CRS treatment. So, what happens with the SNOT 22? The patient's symptomatology will tell you whether exactly this patient is a patient of CRS. So this form is given to the patient. Patient fills up and tell you that, and you get to know that these are the problems with the patient with their grading. This helps you in the further follow-up also that how much the patient is relieved of their problem. If anything more to be, you know, need to be treated. If patient is more and more focused on the headache, you may not need to involve the neurologist or refer some neurologist or something like that. So it prevents misdiagnosis. It involves patient in the problem. It involves the patient in decision to take a call for the face. Many a times, it's a very, very difficult decision. You know, what happens? You have given maximum medical treatment. Patient is getting relieved. You are giving again and again antibiotic steroid course. Patient is getting relieved. And you have to ultimately take a call for the sinus surgery. And with this, with the patient's reported symptomology, symptomatology, it helps patient to understand better that you need really need surgery. Your symptoms are not coming under control with the medical treatment. And you can take a better call, taking the patient in confidence that the surgery is required. And it helps avoiding you a lot of medical legal problems. So this note 22 scoring is a very simple scoring. Just give this performa to the patient. And every time, in the even in the follow-up, you can get the performa done so that you can get to know what exactly the problem is going on, whether it is actually CRS or something else. And patient is always, you know, you know in the loop of the decision-making process. Now, coming to the CRS, by and large, what we see in clinical practice, there are two types of CRS. One is polypoidal, one is non-polypoidal with some purulence or something or secretions in the middle meters, what we see, these are clinical manifestations with a polyp and without polyp, though it has a, you know, difference in terms of the pathophysiology process going on inside. The polyp has a different uh, pathway going on and non-polypoidal has a different pathway and different prognosis, different treatment, everything is different. But this is not everything. You know, even in the polypoid disease, what, why, why, why I'm sharing all this? There are lots of endotypes discovered now. Same polyp patient could be having different pathophysiologic mechanism, number of different pathophysiologic mechanism, and each pathophysiology mechanism has a different answer, different target, and a different outcome. And if we treat all them in the same line, we cannot have a expected outcome. What we, you believe? So this is. Simple manifestation, clinical manifestation, we divide into polypoidal, non-polypoidal category. Now to understand this progress in the science, we need to understand what exactly we have found as targets for the treatment. As I'll share with you all the 4,000 articles, you can even more go into the depth and find more and more, you know, as a think tank, you can work on it and found more and more you know, targets to define a better treatment. So what exactly this disease is in next five minutes, like our body's defense mechanism, our sinonasal cavity also is a defense mechanism. 
and it is governed by several factors. This is so important to understand because every time we, when we come to a different endotype, we have to move back to this, that what exactly we are treating. This is inflammatory condition. This is dysregulated immunity. Our body's sinonasal cavity has an immunity for the pathogens because we are exposed to the pathogen all the time, whatever we inhale from the environment, toxins, microbes, and so many other things. And the sinonasal epithelium has an ability to combat all those challenges effectively. And if that immunity is maintained, we are away from all these problems. So that immunity is governed by at the epithelium level by three things, the epithelium junctions, tight junctions, then the mucociliary activity that the mucus is covering the epithelium and the ciliary activity propels the mucus. Whatever challenge comes from the environment, it trapped by the mucus and expelled to the nasopharynx and then to the gut. And the third one is there are lots of, more than 1,000 variety of antimicrobial proteins which are secreted by the epithelium to combat every individual different challenge. And this is so important to understand. This is the one of the main site of the research work to assess what is the deficiency at the mucosal level which can be covered or which is responsible for the disease and which can be covered as a target for the future better treatment. Like a lot of antimicrobial protein, cathelidine is one of the most important antimicrobial protein and it is improved by the vitamin D. So all those patients who are severely deficient with vitamin D have inability to produce more cathelidines and have more, you know, immune dysfunction and can lead to problems. So there are so many targets have been defined which are responsible, the hypofunction of that is responsible for the, you know, lack of immunity. And if some challenge comes to the mucosa, you know what happens? Our mucosal immunity, whatever comes to the mucosa, epithelium, mucociliary junction and all these proteins, combat them and expel. And if the immunity is down, that challenge stimulate, enters the mucosa and stimulates the adaptive immunity and which is responsible to combat the challenge. If that immunity is dysregulated, the whole exercise, the symptomatology of CRS happens. That is the simple core thing we need to understand. See this. If the, this is one slide explains everything every time because this is the, this is the point which has helped us defining new targets. As I said, the future is medical treatment and this is how understanding this cascade has defined as a new target to treat the CRS in a better manner. So whatever antigen, whatever challenge which is able to cross the mucosa, is attached to the receptors at the mucosal level and that starts immune response by means of a lot of, you know, cytokines, dendritic cells and every, every antigen, every challenge has the ability to induce a different pathway. Those challenges which, you know, for example, the challenges which is so severe in terms of immune disturbance which stimulate the T helper cell, two kind of cells, to stimulate the interleukin 4, 5, 13 to give us a eosinophilic recruitment and, you know, immunoglobulin E recruitment and lots of mast cells, basophils and immunoglobulin E, e and orchestra a different kind of a severe inflammation leading to the polyposis. That is one pathway. Other pathways stimulating T helper one cell to bring in the neutrophils in the action and then other group of cytokines in action and give a non-polypoidal disease. So it depends upon the challenge which has come through the mucosa to incite what kind of pathway is going to be stimulated. And that is the core concept we need to understand because understanding these pathways has given us new target. What we are seeing as a polyps and non-polypoidal disease is a manifestation, clinical manifestation. And what is happening at the molecular level is what is here. If we block the disease process at the molecular level, we need not to reach to the, uh, you know, treatment to the uh, clinical manifestations, all disease can be curbed at the molecular level before reaching to the level of clinical manifestation and that is the future. That is what happened in the cancer treatment also. The targets have been defined, the targeted anti monoclonal antibodies are the treatment of choice like for lymphomas. Lymphomas, no need of surgeries. The molecular targets are defined for each and every variety of lymphoma and the targeted therapy is the cure for that cancer. That is going to happen for all cancers. And same is the future for kind of this disease. This is a pure 
immune complex disease wherein a dysregulated immunity is responsible for a you know kind of clinical manifestation because of the according to the challenge like for examples these if we block the molecular pathway at this level to produce interleukin 25 23 at the level of you know block the interleukin 5 interleukin 4 interleukin 13 we can further you know prevent the manifestations of crs by means of polyp by means of immunoglobulin e recruitment and by means of other things so the target the aim is aim is to define the molecular targets for the future treatment and which is going to establish as the future co-treatment of crs rather than the sinus surgery there are many other hypotheses one of them is the bitter test theory it has been very very popular as one of the theories to you know give progress to the crs we all know this is inflammatory disease this is not infective disease the microbes have no role except to modify the course of disease similarly there are lots of defense mechanism and one of them is the test receptor test receptors are not only on the tongue but in the entire airway and one of them is t2r38 it is very very important test receptors which are the ligands for acyl hormone lectors given off by the gram negative bacteria they sense gram negative bacteria very early and once they sense the gram negative bacteria it opens up the nitrous oxide challenge opens up calcium ions and the mucociliary activity is exaggerated and those gram negatives can be expelled out so it is a very very strong mechanism to combat gram negative mechanism and one of the you know mutation of this test receptor leads to crs this has been documented several times and in the clinical sense those are good bitter testers are unlikely to have crs this has been very very uh, proven you can test yourself if you are a good bitter tester or not and you can you can have a sort of good immunity against the development of the crs in the future so this is one of the you know uh, future you can say so what we have achieved by this understanding we have found a lot of new targets we have understood the pathophysiologic mechanism going on behind development of the crs and these targeted therapies are approved by the fda many for the you know treatment of the asthma which is the same drivers of inflammation ongoing what we are looking what we are uh, you know discussing at the upper airway crs the same kind of drivers are involved in the pathophysiology of asthma at the lower airway level crs you can say in the simplest term as the asthma of the upper airway the same interleukins same cytokines same drivers of inflammation are involved at the lower airway epithelium which are at the upper airway epithelium so there are new targets and many of these you know monoclonal antibodies are developed and marketed by lot many companies and lot of being you know used in the lower airway for the severe asthma now since many of the targets have been redefined now we have many of the options to use the monoclonal antibodies for the particular kind of crs i said crs has various endotypes every endotype has a different pathophysiologic process and to tailor the treatment according to pathophysiology the various monoclonal antibodies are available though the way is far off for them to come to the clinical practice for the regular use but yes in 10 15 years down the line as more and more research work is going on they are going to establish themselves as a core medical treatment preventing clinical manifestations of polyps and other things of the crs as they are going to be the core treatment so there are various targets and various monoclonal antibodies which are available in the market we'll discuss again and again now coming to the diagnosis we know two things we have been uh, knowing very well that the endoscoping and ct scan are the most important investigation which are needed in every patient before you take up for surgery or take any call or any decision for sinus surgery or something else this is not the end believe me why 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 this exercise started again we operate upon a patient surgery fails you can say in broad terms and patient requires the surgery again and the disease comes back we need to know what exactly is we are failing where exactly we are failing what is the missing link 
why we have not understood this disease properly and these are other investigations which are needed in many of the patients to know the particular disease profile. It is not the endoscopy or CT scan that will show us that it is patient as a CRS. CT scan, again, there is a controversy when to get a CT scan done up front or later on. Yes, the role of CT scan is just to give us a three-dimensional anatomy of the area where we are operating. Least in the diagnosis, just some time needed to rule out, to reach a correct diagnosis, to rule out something. Sometimes you have a pathophysiology pointing out to be CRS, but it doesn't turn out to be CRS or severe CRS enough to, you know, uh, needing any uh, endoscopic surgery or something. So the need of the CT scan is sometimes confusing. You may need some time upfront. There are a lot of research now, a lot of publications coming that the upfront CT scan is much better. Because if you are treating or something as unnecessary medical treatment, uh, you know, offered to the patient for something else which is not required. So it is all your clinical decision when to get a CT scan done, but definitely it is never repeated because it gives the same anatomy. Uh, the information is the same as the anatomy doesn't change. So uh, why these all investigations are needed? Please feel free to interrupt any time for any confusion or anything uh, you know you want to know in your practice or anything you do differently. Yeah, there are lots of mic in the auditorium. You can ask for the mic and uh, you know ask your question or interrupt me any point of time. So why these all investigations are needing? Patient come to you with a one single question when you are operating upon the cases with a polyposis or something. Doctor, will I need a surgery again? I have come to know this is a notorious disease which requires surgery again and again. How can you answer that? You need to know the profile of the disease, what exactly is happening inside the patient, what kind of a profile of a disease. It may look like a polyp, the same polyp can have a different profile. And to know that, what exactly this kind of disease, we need to have a lot of these kind of information. Eosinophilia is one of the most uh, you know important factor giving to recalcitrant disease. If there is too much of eosinophilia, serum eosinophilia, mucosin eosinophilia, it is bound to come back as it requires more and more steroids. As I said, steroid works at the every cascade of the pathophysiology. What we have seen, the pathophysiological cascade. In the present context, monoclonal antibodies are not available. The only thing which works at every level is steroids. More and more eosinophilia are more severe drivers of inflammation requiring more and more steroids. If some patient has a severe eosinophilia, you can tell them up front, it is likely to come back. You need more steroids in the future. You need more aggressive follow-up. You may require a revision surgery or we may do a, we may need to do an aggressive surgery up front to prevent recurrence. So you have to be prepared to deal with a more aggressive situation, something like that. IgE is so important. Believe me, as we go uh, in the detailed part of the discussion, IgE is single most important factor in taking a call for the surgery, in taking a call for other adjuvant therapy. For example, if patient does a low serum IgE, any patient coming to you with a low serum IgE with CRS symptoms, CRS symptomatology, CRS CT scan, everything is the diagnosis of CRS. My first answer is not surgery. Those are the patients who respond best to the macrolide antibiotics. So if the IgE is low, the question of surgery is ruled out and many a times, more than 80% of the time, you can cure the patient with a medical treatment only. If the patient has a high IgE, then the situation is again different. High IgE could be because of the allergy. And those are the patients where the allergy is the main driver of inflammation. And those patients require allergic treatment as a prime adjuvant treatment along with the CRS. And if you don't treat allergy, the patient's symptomatology and everything is not going to come under control. So with this IG gives you a lot of good information about taking a decision. -making. Very, very disproportionately high IG. One of the, you know, uh, uh, understanding which has been made now is because of Staph aureus infection. Staph aureus gives totally clonal expansion of Ig. It produces enterotoxin, which expenses, which you know, you know, starts stimulates the Ig production like anything. And the maximum Ig, the patient has a serum Ig four thousand. You can believe that could be having Staph aureus infection, ongoing infection, and you have to direct 
your treatment according to the staph aureus could be biofilms, could be intracellular staph aureus, which is not, you know, I mean, able to any regular treatment. And that's a difficult patient and you need to treat accordingly and direct your antibiotics according to the, uh, you know, staph aureus, maybe topical antibiotics or whatever to deal with that difficult situation. So this profile tells you what exactly the patient is having. Without knowing all this, if you try to operate, there are some other, without understanding the disease, is a likely outcome is never, never possible. So, generally, as I said, it's an inflammatory disease. Antibiotics are never needed. Rarely needed, I would say. Antibiotics are needed only if there is secondary infection. You can confirm by means of simple, uh, you know, C-reactive proteins, by means of simple culture sensitivity, if it is a direct culture-directed antibiotic, as I'll come later with a concept of microbiome, where you have to preserve microbiome by means of giving minimal antibiotics for this pathology. Immune, immunity is one of the aspects. Many a patient will discuss in detail later. Many, a chunk of patients of this disease are immunodeficient. Believe me, we deal with so many revisions. Up to 10% of the patient has some or other defect in the immunity. This is like a syndrome. And if you are not aware of it, you cannot get a desired result. Any patient, this is an inflammatory disease. This is disease because of dysregulated immunity. Anything which has a positive outcome on the overall immune aspect of the patient will have a favorable result. Any treatment. Any treatment which has a, or anything which has a negative impact on the overall immunity will result in a negative aspect of the treatment and will never give us a desired result. So immunity assessment will come in detail is a very, very integral part on certain patients. We need to know which patient require immune, uh, you know, assessment. Uh, I'll show with some slides that which patients are group of patients which require a proper immune assessment, which is otherwise overlooked and start treating the patient on the line of CRS for the sinus surgery. So immune assessment is very, very important for the desired, you know, outcome. Aspirin sensitive, uh, you know, testing is one of the important as it, it discovers one of the important endotypes of the CRS one of the endotype, which is the most extensive inflammatory aspect on the entire spectrum of CRS. CRS has lots of endotypes, as um, I'm going to share with you. And one of the endotype, which is the most extensive inflammatory spectrum, is AERD, aspirin exaggerated respiratory disease, which is most difficult to control. And if you don't understand that pathophysiology and keep treating those patients on the line of the surgery, you operate upon 100 times on those patients and it is bound to come back. So those are the most severe patients and we need to understand this by means of clinical suspicion and then for the aspirin testing and then for the treatment. Like for example, any patient coming with a polyposis, having asthma must be tested for aspirin sensitivity to confirm as a center stride or aspirin exaggerated respiratory disease. If not confirmed, if those patients not sensitize, desensitize with the aspirin, however number of times you operate, they are bound to come back with the same disease because the underlying pathology, physiologic process is because of aspirin sensitivity where a lot of leukotrienes are overproduced and that is driving the inflammation. So this is very important. So you have to be suspicious all the time with every patient that what kind of this patient is and what kind of underlying pathophysiology that particular patient has to treat that patient accordingly. And that is the concept of precision medicine. Every patient has a, you know, different underlying pathophysiology. Histopathology, we have now adopted as a regular part of our uh, surgical exercise to send all the specimen or part of the specimen, which are part of the representative mucosa for the histopathology. This is very important. And it saves you from a lot of medical legal problems also, besides giving you the insight of the particular patient disease. For example, like the same patient asking you whether my polyps are going to come back, will I need surgery again, doctor? And your answer should be reserved with some information. For some information, like in malignancy, we say, will our further adjuvant therapy will be directed by the final histopathology report. Whether it requires chemotherapy, radiation therapy, combination, concurrent, whatever, it depends upon your, you know, spread of the disease, whether it has gone to the extracapsular spread, multiple lymph nodes, what exactly the profile is. So mucosal histopathology will give you the most important information about the mucosal eosinophilia. 
that is one of the most important drivers of the inflammation. If the patient has a severe mucosal eosinophilia, you can tell them your disease is very, very severe. It requires more extensive, more close follow-up, more, you know, long-term steroid irrigations, more long-term follow-up to prevent treatment, uh, prevent recurrences and all that. And vitamin D and so many other things we'll discuss, which are, you know, drivers or the things which affect on the immune aspect of the patient. By and large, it is dysregulated immunity, immune complex disease, anything which improves the immune aspect of the patient will have a positive impact, as simple as that. So, CT scan will discuss later during the surgical part. Simple, vitamin D. We know vitamin D deficiency is very common, but severe deficiency of vitamin D has a significant impact on the immune aspect of the patient by various methodologies, by various regions, vitamin D affects the immune system of the patient. Many a time, severe vitamin D deficient patients become steroid insensitive because vitamin D stimulates the glucocorticoid receptors. And we have seen many of the CRS patients, particularly AFRS patients where the vitamin D level is 10 times below and those definitely improve with the vitamin D supplementation Good morning, supplementation for their uh, overall morning, treatment. Dr. Yes, sir. Yes. Dr. Ajay Gupta from Tata Main Hospital. Please. Please. Sir, will you be further elaborating upon the aspirin hypersensitivity testing, how it is done and in what setup we should be doing this? Would you be further elaborating in yeah, I will show future sessions? In the next slides. Yeah. But since you have asked, aspirin sensitivity should be done in all patients, all poly patients who have asthma. By and large, poly patients having asthma have more than 20% chance of having AERD. In general, all poly patients, up to 5 to 7% patients are having AERD, which goes underdiagnosed, undiagnosed, and you keep on repeatedly operating on those patients. If you've been undiagnosed, it's never going to cure your patient. In general, 10 to 15% of the patients who are asthmatic may not be having polyps have AERD. So this is not uncommon, but this remains underdiagnosed. And this is one of the important aspects of the, you know, disease. I'll come to the asthma part and tell you, you make your pulmonologist your friend, your practice will be doubled. Believe me. This CRS is so underdiagnosed, misdiagnosed. As I said, less than 10% of the patients are being treated by the otolaryngologist. Those patients are being treated by the GPs, considering as a common call or something else, which are actually CRS patients. And ultimately, they develop lower airway problems because this is a unified airway. So those CRS patients being treated by the GPs, ultimately, they become asthmatic and then they move on to the pulmonologist. Again, otolaryngologist is nowhere in the scene. And if you retrospectively see all those asthmatics or any asthmatic patient, you get 100 asthmatic patients requiring oral steroids, topical steroids or inhalational steroids for their control of their symptoms, out of 100 patients, more than 60% have CRS. Primarily CRS, for which they were being treated by the GPs. Since they overlook the nasal symptoms coming to the otolaryngologist. But once they develop lower airway symptoms, then they go to the pulmonologist, considering as a major problem. And pulmonologists will never look at the upper airway, never look at the sinuses and keep on giving inhalational steroids. And other so your ENT patients primarily were, you know, with the GPs and then finally with the pulmonologists and you are nowhere in the scene. So make pulmonologists your friends. 80% of the asthma patients can be cured. If not cured, the need of asthma medication can be reduced to maximally low you can reduce 90% of the medication of the asthma patient by treatment of the CRS. But that is not happening because of lack of coordination amongst pulmonologists and ENT surgeons. So that requires a close call, close coordinations among them. And if you have a pulmonologist friend and you have a good coordination, and this is for the patient benefit, all those poor patients otherwise on inhalational oral steroid for live pulmonologists will never send to ENT for the CRS management. It is never going to happen the pulmonologist is sending to you unless you convince them about this unified airway concept and convince them that actually it is the CRS which has led to asthma. It is not primarily endogenous asthma 
this percentage of the endonesian asthma is very less it is secondary asthma because of the upper airway problem is undiagnosed untreated upper airway which led to the lower airway problem and which actually should be treated by the otolaryngologist by means of treatment of crs because the drivers of inflammation are same so such a huge you know chunk of crs patients are lying with the pulmonologist and being treated unnecessarily with lots of steroids for the asthma so we'll discuss this um, aerd later sir so vitamin d has a lot of role and it has a lot of immunomodulatory functions. We have seen the CRS cascade earlier. This vitamin D works at lots of level of the CRS, you know, pathophysiologic cascade to improve the overall immunity. Anything which improves the immunity is going to have a positive impact. And vitamin D is one of the factors which has a, you know, huge positive impact. Particularly those patients who are severely deficient should be supplemented and improve the C. In our hands for this medical disease, we have nothing more uh, to treat for the surgical aspect. For medical treatment, we have hardly anything just to give oral topical steroid or saline irrigation, something. So anything which improve the immunity, we need to look always for that and do something to improve the immunity. And now we have understood in our medical treatment, we have a lot of things in the basket to improve the immunity. By means of how this thinking has come, by means of understanding this pathophysiological targets this pathophysiological process we have understood and this is the histopathology report which we have given to our pathologists to report always on this yes sir mike dados yeah they usually do vitamin d3 so what is your comment on that? Yes, so vitamin D3 is what we can measure. Your question is right. Let me you know, answer your actual problem. That's a good question. The, what we measure is a circulating vitamin D3. That is not active form which works at the cellular level. You know, how the vitamin D is produced. Either we take as an oral intake or the 7D hydrocholesterol in the skin is transformed by the UV rays from the sunlight to vitamin D. And that vitamin D is circulatory form of vitamin D. To become active, it has to be hydroxylated twice, once in liver, once in kidney again, to become 125 hydroxy vitamin D, which is the active form. And for that, there are various receptors on the airway cells. So what we measure is the circulatory vitamin D, and that is what the thing which can measure. If you have insufficient circulatory vitamin D, obviously you will have insufficient you know, active vitamin D form. So that is what we can measure and we have to look at that way other, on that part. Sir, one thing, in how will we differentiate between allergic rhinitis and clonic rhinosinusitis? Because the chart you have given, two things like blockage and nasal discharge is also present in allergic rhinitis. And Symptomatology in is overlapping, you are right. See, allergic rhinitis is a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction to some environmental allergen, which is otherwise harmless, but the body is considering harmful and react strongly by means of IgE-mediated mechanism. So symptomatology of allergy is altogether different by means of predominance of sneezing, watery discharge, itching, itching in the eyes, itching in the skin or somewhere else. So those are the predominant symptoms. CRS has a different predominant symptomatology as compared to allergy. Sometimes the patient may have associated allergy. More than 60% of the polypoidal sinusitis patients have associated allergy. So treatment of allergy is one of the most important adjuvant therapy to the CRS. Otherwise, your question is valid. Sometimes you have given a good treatment for the CRS but overlook the allergy and the patient will come back with the same, I have again the running nose, I have the obstruction, doctor, your surgery has failed. It's not the surgery has failed. You have overlooked the adjuvant, you know, the uh, comorbidity which you have not treated, which requires a definitive treatment by means of symptomatology and immunotherapy and other things. So that is important. So what in the present context, what are you left with? What are the management options? Now the clinical scenario start. What can we do as a part of medical treatment to this disease? This is very, very important. Every patient is not surgical patient. And what best medical treatment we can give 
in the present context, looking at the, you know, taking the advantage of the recent research work. So we have seen the pathophysiological cascade of CRS development. And in the present context, the only thing which works at every level is the corticosteroid. It improves the innate immunity, it improves the adaptive immunity, it reduces the secretions of cytokines and everything to bring back the cytokine cascade, which is aggravated in the CRS. So the, we can give steroids as a powerful as a weapon, what we can say as the only weapon which works effectively in CRS patient. But we have our own reservations. We cannot continue oral steroids for long because of their own adverse effects. So what we are left with was a choice of topical steroids. We, and what are the topical steroids in the present context? The most, uh, I would say, the next, uh, the generation steroids are the mometazone and fluticazone, which are safest one with least bioavailability, less than 1% to the systemic circulation. So that's the only choice we are left with in the present context as far as the medical treatment is concerned. Looking at the CRS cascade, we have understood this fact that steroid works at every level. And we have only option is topical steroids. Now, if the patient inflammatory load is too much, too high to be taken by the topical steroid, then how the patient's symptom will be under control? How the CRS will come under control? So, now there comes the role of sinus surgery. If the inflammatory load is low, steroid is a treatment, topical steroid is a treatment. Yes, you can give Sometimes you have an acute symptom, acute load, you can give oral steroid for a small course of oral steroid for 5-10 days. In between, not so much because they have their own adverse effect. In our country, we can give steroid randomly to every patient without keeping a record. But in the Western countries, you have to keep a track record of every single dose of steroid given in the particular year because the cumulative dose of steroid has an impact on lots of systemic comorbidities. So, steroid, oral steroids, we have our limitations on what we have left with as a weapon is the topical steroid and those patients who have inflammatory load this is too much to be taken by topical steroid requires sinus surgery that's the indication for sinus surgery in general so the role of sinus surgery i said in the beginning is three prong if the inflammatory load is too much the sinus surgery will reduce the inflammatory load and then that reduced inflammatory load can be taken care of by the topical steroids again but the things have changed after the sinus surgery. Before sinus surgery, as the sinuses were unopened, our option was to use only nasal sprays, which do not cross beyond anterior one third of the nasal cavity. And what we need, the sprays of the steroid at the destination where the, where the mucosal disease in the deep in the sinuses. But now with the, after the sinus surgery, the things have changed. The goal of sinus surgery I mentioned in the beginning is to give wide openings to introduce the topical steroid in the depth. So in that scenario, in the post-operative scenario, now we have an option to introduce the topical steroid in the depth. That is the second advantage of sinus surgery. Besides reducing the inflammatory load, besides establishing the ventilation drainage, it gives you and it opens up the avenues for the topical steroids to reach in the depth. And we have lots of you know mechanics involved. We have lots of ways to introduce those high dose topical steroids in the depth of the sinuses. The advantage is you can use high dose steroids right at the destination, at the desired place, at the desired mucosal level, yet without systemic side effect. That's the biggest, you know, advantage of the sinus surgery in the present context. So these are the, you know, advantages of the sinus surgery. But in the future, as I said, yes, please. Yes. So I, I'll come with that concept later on. Your point is right, microbiome. We need good bacteria to improve immunity. I have already mentioned anything which improves the sinonasal immunity or overall immunity of the body will have a positive impact. And one of them is strengthening the good bacteria. That is one of the most important concepts. I'll come very soon. The concept of microbiome, which is important, very important. And a lot of therapeutic strategies have uh, come to improve that. So in the present context, beside the medical treatment, if medical treatment fails and surgical treatment fails, and in the future, is the targeted therapy. So even now, in the present context, FDA has approved dupilumab as one of the uh, monoclonal antibody for the use for CRS 
type 2 CRS, CRS with polyposis in severe conditions. So what are the indications in the present context? You can use monoclonal antibodies in the present scenario also in certain group of patients where you cannot do sinus surgery. Where still the disease is not coming under control with the sinus surgery are the indications for biologic therapy or monoclonal, monoclonal antibodies. If your disease is severely uncontrolled, requiring oral steroid every now and then, you cannot give oral steroid every now and then. And those are the true patients for the dupilumab therapy, which has been approved by the FDA. And even the we can buy the dupilumab, which is being marketed by the Novartis nowadays. And you can treat those patients, though it's a very, very expensive drug, but still it has resolved its plates even in the present context. I know, I have already told, it is going to be the future 10, 15 years down the line when the cost comes down and when a lot of other things are much clearer in terms of long-term adverse events and, you know, efficacy. But even in the present context, the dupilumab is available and is reserved for these patients which have severe uncontrolled steroid-resistant disease and which have severe quality of life improvement and their asthma in spite of all measures, in spite of, you know, inhalation or steroids still not coming under control are the real candidates for, you know, dupilumab therapy. Those patients who have severe symptoms cannot undergo sinus surgery because of their fitness issues and other issues and other comorbidities, other systemic comorbidities are real candidates for the biologic therapy or dupilumab therapy. Dupilumab because that's the only biologic which is approved for the treatment for CRS. There are so many other omalizumab, anti-IG, mepolizumab, anti-IL-5 are available for the treatment for this disease but at a lower airway for the asthma, not for the upper airway. So for the upper airway, the only option we have nowadays, uh, which the FDA has approved, is the dupilumab. But there are limitations. Look at the cost. The annual cost, every two weeks you have to give an injection and it costs uh, the hell of a money uh, for the uh, people like in our country. So there are things to be established in the times to come and the cost is going to come down for sure as more and more production done by the other companies and a lot of other issues will be settled down the line like long-term efficacy, long-term adverse event. We have to identify the true responders, you know, the markers for the patient who are going to respond to the biologics, who are not going to respond to the biologics and how long is going to be the treatment, what is the end point of treatment. So much has to be, still has to be defined and to establish as a you know, the preferred treatment for this disease at the molecular level targeted therapy like, like it has been established for the treatment of lymphoma and other diseases. And in times to come, this is going to be the established treatment, not the sinus surgery, because that is clinical manifestations we are treating, not at the disease at the molecular level. So what we can do in the present context? As I said, we can give topical steroids, we can give oral steroids sometimes. There are other drugs which have some place because since we are left with limited weapons, we are in look, we are looking for more and more, you know, you know, drugs, more and more therapies which can have some or other effect on the CRS before the targeted therapies have, uh, you know, comes. So for by and large, for the polypoidal disease, Yes, obviously for any disease, polypoidal, non-polypoidal, saline irrigation is the core part of the treat treatment. Every prescription should involve saline irrigation. This is something which drives away the inflammatory mediators from the nasal cavity and from the mucosal surface, from the microbes and so many environmental things and improve the mucociliary clearance. So that is one of the most important part of the innate immunity and which is improved by the saline irrigation. So these patients should be, any CRS patient should always be subjected for saline irrigation. For polypoidal disease, topical steroid, with burst of oral steroid courses in between if they have severe symptoms, in between, not always. So oral cortical steroids should be limited, but the topical is the answer. These are the weapons in our basket in the present context. If they don't work, sinus surgery is the answer, as simple as that. So... Other drugs which works and we use in our practice is doxycycline for the polypoidal disease. It has a huge impact in terms of reducing the inflammation, not as an antibiotic. We all know doxycycline has been a, uh, you know, uh, antibiotic being used for ages, but this is not being used as an antibiotic here as an immunomodulator. As it exerts immunomodulatory effect by several ways, I'll uh, come later. 
and montelukast particularly for the lower airway receptors more and more in the lower airway not in the upper airway but some patients have you know uh, associated lower airway symptoms there you can add on montelukast too these are the ways to reduce the inflammation to certain extent if the patient can maintain control symptoms with reduced inflammation with all these therapy there is no need of surgery if still the symptoms persist the disease persists then you have to take a call that's the way and for the non polypoidal disease which has a different pathophysiology undergoing neutrophilic predominance pathophysiology for them steroids have hardly any role the target is neutrophils antibiotics are the main stay of treatment and in for these patients nowadays the macrolides have come up as a big treatment and more than 80% of the non polypoidal disease non polypoidal sinusitis believe me can be cured with a medical treatment there is no need of surgery as far as the you know if we divide the overall patients of sinusitis you know what percent of the cases are polypoidal what percentage are non polypoidal more than 80% are non polypoidal those are not difficult to treat kind of sinusitis more than 80% and those are the patients who have a different profile those patient can be treated on medical treatment by means of macrolide i am coming on that and those are the patients who are not eosinophilic driven that is a very very important part and those patients are our target to treat with the medical disease and they have hardly any role with the steroids so and by and large anti fungals have no place in the overall treatment of crs there no point in giving by any means anti fungal for any non invasive fungal pathology or any kind of crs there are a lot of people have a you know practice to give anti fungal there has been theory proposed by the the fungal theory for the crs you know causation and everything it has been all ruled out very very clearly now and anti fungals have practically zero role in the overall treatments of crs so steroids topical steroids are the mainstay a topical being topical they have excellent safety profile safety profile that's why we are using we cannot use oral steroid every now and then and these topicals have effect at every level of the crs cascade that's the point they reduce all the cytokines involved they reduce immunoglobulin e they reduce interleukins everything they reduce and that's why we are using anfutigazone mometazone are the uh, most popular one but the only disadvantage is they don't penetrate beyond entire one third of the nasal cavity so we have our you know uh, the limited effect of these topical systemic definitely has a huge impact but we use them preferentially in certain situations like short term management like improving the surgical field before surgery to blunt the inflammation see what happens in the crs surgery what happens in the sinus surgery in any any endoscopic surgery we want a good surgical field and with the ongoing inflammation this kind of inflammation going on this vaso dilation lead to lot of bleeding and to order to control the bleeding you have to curb the inflammation and then pre operative course of steroids is very very important in such polypoidal eosinophilic disease and even in the post op period to reduce the inflammation they work well otherwise there is no role of using or we should avoid using systemic steroids every now and then for the uh, polypoidal disease this doxycycline as i mentioned has lot of impact it is anti staphylococci drug besides that besides that it has a lot of immunomodulatory effects and these immunomodulatory effects are the primary reason for directing the use of doxycycline not as an not as an antibiotic where doxycycline is used and this is very very important in a polypoidal disease where the tissue edema is mainly because of the you know activity of the metalloproteinases which is inhibited by the doxycycline we give a course of doxycycline to our patients first day 200 mg and then 100 mg once a day for at least 3 weeks and it reduces the inflammation along with a short course of oral steroid to the maximum what we can achieve by the medical treatment in polypoidal disease besides that if it doesn't work then you have to consider sinus there is no other way no weapon in the present context as far as the medical treatment for the polypoidal disease is concerned at the maximum level now the most important thing are the macrolides macrolides to me in sinusitis are called as wonder drugs 
wonder drugs though they are bacteriostatic but they work at every level every difficult situation you can think of in sinusitis the macrolides work they have the tendency to accumulate intracellular not only uh, you know at the in the serum but in the intracellular in the leukocytes wherever the inflammation is there they reach very fast and they work very well and they prevent formation of biofilms by several mechanism you know in inflammatory disease in the non polypoidal sinusitis the major factor limiting our treatment or the major obstacle in the success of the treatment are the biofilms and this macrolides they exert so many activities they prevent the formation of biofilm by means of preventing quorum sensing by means of preventing polysaccharide shell around them by means of you know preventing lots of other uh, materials which prevent biofilm formation or disrupt the biofilm but by and large the macrolides act at the neutrophils so wherever is the neutrophilic activity macrolides work wherever the difficult bacteria intracellular macrolide work wherever the immunodeficiency patient macrolide work wherever is the osteitis bony inflammation everything macrolide work they prevent bony osteitis bony osteitis and so many things so out of the macrolides we all know in our practice we know clarithromycin azithromycin and so many things in our practice mostly we use clarithromycin in low doses for months together and they bring down the inflammation most of 80% or more than 80% of the non polypoidal sinusitis can be cured by the macrolides alone low dose long term macrolides you have to be careful you have to involve sometime physician when you give macrolides to so the elderly patient with multiple systemic disease because they have lot of drug interaction sometime particularly the cardiac patients and other patients so we have our physician and team to take care of that but in those all difficult patients we give azithromycin otherwise clarithromycin is the drug of choice as a macrolide wherever we use so at the sinusitis cascade you have seen the earlier the crs cascade this macrolide drug as a wonder drug it works at the every level of the sinusitis cascade by means of improving the immunity by means of reducing the diver drivers of the immunity by means of reducing the cytokines of the immunity and they are considered as a wonder drug in sinusitis at every level but how to choose the patient for macrolide whom to give whom not to give by and large all steroid resistant patient should be given macrolides all patient i said in the beginning one of the most important test in our you know uh, in our list is the ige and all those patients who have either normal or low ig should be given preferentially irrespective of the disease status whether polyps or not should be given macrolides or should be offered macrolides as a primary treatment for all those patients because they have maximum efficacy in those in those situation patients who primarily present with certain symptoms like post nasal drip facial pain those are the symptoms which are related to the impaired mucociliary activity and those symptoms are best improved by the mucolides as they have a positive impact on the mucus secretion mucus you know rheology and so many things that improve the overall mucus and these are the patients where we should avoid giving mucolides as the, these are the poor responders of the mucolides you can say so macrolides can be given in many or maximum crs conditions many a times even in the eosinophilic condition we have when there is associated neutrophilic inflammation but in these situations particularly in allergic patient we should avoid giving macrolide macrolides have no role when there is abundance of ig when there is allergy otherwise the macrolides work everywhere so as i said in the beginning this is like this crs is like a syndrome syndrome means there are lots of things which affect the crs outcome and if you ignore any of them the likely outcome of the crs treatment is something you will never get so you need to understand those comorbidities we should not overlook these comorbidities and we should treat them together to get good outcome and these have lots of prognostic values also to prevent medical legal issues and all that so for example we have understood like we discussed earlier this is unified airway concept upper airway and lower airway are same unified airway part of the same airway and the drivers of inflammation 
or the mucosal disease in the both upper and lower way our airway is drive, driven by same cytokines and inflammatory molecules so this is a very very complex relationship between the upper airway and lower airway and by understanding these concepts like sir ask about the allergic rhinitis we must treat allergic rhinitis as a comorbidity as lot of sinusitis endotypes i am coming to the different endotypes of sinusitis now some of the endotypes are purely allergic driven like afrs is pure allergy ccad central compartment atopic disease is pure allergy and those endotypes sometimes or they all almost always they deserve a proper treatment of the allergy simultaneously otherwise the desired effect cannot be you know ascertained in those situations so allergy is something if somebody ask you that allergies is allergy responsible for crs yes for some of the endotypes of the crs allergy is responsible otherwise allergy gives you a, because the same inflammatory drivers are used in the allergy same ige same type 2 inflammatory drivers are in, involved in the ig allergy causation it gives the same pro inflammatory stage where the crs can easily establish its place so it gives you it primes the mucosa for the crs to established later on so treatment of the allergy is very very important in those situation and particularly when allergy is associated with some anatomical variants which can predispose to the crs so it is a unified airway and as sir asked earlier about the asthma this is one of the most important part we need to understand many of the crs patient particularly poly patient more than 60% ultimately over the period of time develop or become asthmatic and many of the asthmatic as i said more than 80% of the you know secondary asthma which is most prevalent have some or other form of crs so make pulmonologists your friend convince them discuss with them go to the pulmonology conferences present your work about this unified concept and you will definitely able to convince them to make a shared decision making on this subject as majority of the asthma patients are being unnecessarily treated with unnecessarily oral or inhalation whatever steroids if they are crs treated the need of asthma medication can be brought down by 90% and that is something amazing and that's an amazing concept we need to understand and convince our pulmonology friends majority of the asthma patients are actually the candidates they have severe uh, you know uh, inflammatory profile asthma patient who has asthma who had crs earlier and now develop asthma as a severe inflammatory profile and majority of those patients are on some form of steroid therapy and majority are those patients are the candidate for sinus surgery for the reason that you open up the sinuses and given ability for the topical steroids to penetrate to avoid the need of oral steroids in the future so all those patients coming from the pulmonologist are actually your patient for the sinus surgery true patients for the sinus surgery are lying with the pulmonologist what a big you know you know something which has been hidden so far which is because of the lack of collaboration among these two specialties the ENT and the pulmonologists as most of the severe profile patients of crs disease have developed lower airway problems are being treated with the lower airway disorder and the upper airway disorder is ignored and all those are severe patient which actually require sinus surgery so the actual sinus surgery candidates are lying with the pulmonologists so indications of sinus surgery if you ask me majority of the patients are lying with the pulmonologists because those are the patients who had so severe inflammatory profile which has led to the complication and developed lower airway problems so this is the time to call for a collaboration between the uh, the the ENT and the pulmonologists to treat these patients poor patients for the upper airway or the sinus disease rather than being treated unnecessarily for the lower airway with lots of steroids and all those things so other things which can have an impact on the outcome this is something we have observed in our practice you know all this work has come at uh, you know all these um, uh, what i'm sharing is our experience how we have seen our failures and how we went to the literature and trying to improve our failure more and more and this is one of the factor the patient whom you see who is a candidate for surgery you have to convince them to quit smoking and this you can easily counsel them if you use a snot snot 22 scoring 
because the patient himself scores in spite of all medical treatment is not improving and this is one of the factor which has which works at various levels. The smoke has a deleterious effect at various levels at the immune aspect, which leads to, you know, lack of improvement in the overall treatment. So it impairs ciliary function, which is one of the most important desired, you know, factor uh, for the improvement in the sinus disease. So, so many things, it, it works at the mucosal level. The smoke has a deleterious effect and has a negative impact on the overall outcome. And we should convince, encourage these patients to quit smoking. If they don't, they should understand that they are becoming obstacle to their better outcomes. Similarly, the CSOM. See, this has been a 100 years old dictum. Before you go to the ear, before you treat ear, you must look into the nose. And you know, in the present era, because of, you know, with the surgical era, this is becoming less and less. At the moment you see the ear patient, you start thinking of operating. If you have a central perforation, cholesteratoma, you start thinking about operating upon that without looking to the nose. There are reasons to believe that this is a part of the upper airway, unified airway. Unified area is upper airway that includes nose, paranasal sinuses, include you second tube and middle ear mucosa and the lower airway. So this is the entire unified airway. The same pathophysiological mechanism of the upper airway are involved in the ear also. The same inflammatory mediators are involved in the ear pathology. Same microbes you culture from the nose and the ear together because they are same and the conduit to the eustachian tube. Many of the CRS patients have associated CSOM problem. If not CSOM, eustachian tube issues, otitis media with diffusion, retraction, cholesteratoma and so on. If those patients are being treated, we must look into the nose for the CRS. And if the CRS is not treated, you can't expect the desired outcome. Many a times we see we are treating for the cholesterol retraction. And again, the retraction is coming because the use second tube is the major factor. And to prevent use second tubes from recovering, one of the major factors is CRS. So we should not overlook the treatment of the CRS. When we look at the long-standing ear problem, we must look into the nose. At the same time, what we do in all CRS patients, long-standing such patients, we always get a CT scan done nowadays. And with the same CT scan, we look at the sinuses also. The, the, you know, the magnitude of the sinus problem can be ascertained from the same CT scan. And you can change your treatment plan. You can change your counseling. If the nose is needing treatment first than the ear to improve your overall outcome rather than, you know, forcing the patient for the ear problem and ultimate failure. So this is one of the important, you know, uh, point now in the decision making that don't ignore the nose before treating the ear. All these major CRS patients have some or other ear problem and all these, I mean, more than 60% and more, more than 60% of the major ear issues like cholesterol or other things have major nasal problem and this, these should not be overlooked to get a better outcome. I said in the beginning about the immunodeficiency. In our practice, up to 5 to 7% of the patient have some or other immunodeficiency. And this is one thing which is most often overlooked. Most often overlooked means you look at the sinuses, look at the CT scan, look at the nasal endoscopy, polyps and start thinking of surgery. You can get immunoglobulin, all those uh, Ig, SA, eosinophilic assay, yet this is overlooked and this is one of the, if the underlying immunodeficiency is not treated, untreated, you cannot expect a desired outcome because overall it is immune regulated mechanism which is led to the CRS. So anything which has affected the overall immunity has to be taken care of. Otherwise, your whatever surgery, whatever treatment you is bound to fail. So immunodeficiency could be primary, could be, and now it is more and more secondary. You know, the diabetes incidence is increasing, organ transplant, so many other immunity disorders are on rise and we should not overlook all these patients before treating to look into the immune profile of these patients. We have several surprising, you know, immune disorder patients who presented with CRS and if, um, if you don't look at the immune aspect, if you don't treat at the immune aspect, you cannot expect a desired outcome. So how, how come, uh, you know, you suspect immunodeficiency? Patient of CRS coming to you, how can you suspect immunodeficiency on those patients? This is 
something very very important when you have a simple infection giving rise to such a major complication uh, which is surprising complication for a simple sinusitis the patient has developed brain abscess simple sinusitis patient has developed orbital abscess you need to look into the immune aspect of the patient otherwise something you are missing and if that part is not improved you cannot expect a good outcome to patient with unusual progression of the disease unusual persistent you know unusual pathogens on the culture i remember last month i got a culture sensitivity i got actinomycosis in the culture we got the immune profile and that patient has a massive immunodeficiency and so you cannot ignore such aspect so you have to be suspicious all the time if any of these you know clinical findings if you find in your patient you must look into the immune aspect of the patient to improve the overall outcome so these are the conditions where which gives you suspicion regarding the lower immunity and this is a workup what we do in, uh, what we do in our practice besides the counts the cell counts we do the workup for the immunoglobulins which are more than 70% of the time responsible for immunodeficiency either a single immune globulin deficiency or multiple immunoglobulin deficiency common variable deficiency or t cell deficiency which is very common in diabetics you know you have seen the condition malignant otitis sectional what is that antibiotics that's a infective conditions but because of the microvascular disease the antibiotics are not able to penetrate into the into the bone with the bone infection which is given up by the malignant otitis externa and the antibiotics become ineffective they become ineffective because of the loss of phagocytic activity of neutrophils and you can assess by the flow cytometry of the neutrophils and lymphocyte if they have immune dysfunction involve your immunologist otherwise whatever treatment you i we get so many patient being treated for malignant otitis reaction for months together of the antibiotics and all that if you look into the immune aspect they have immune deficiency and that need to be treated by the immunologist to get a desired outcome so the same thing is happening here as well for the complement pathway immunoglobulin pathway t cell pathway that if something is happening at the immune level we must pick up and treat otherwise you'll fall into a you know a, you know failure line so there are if there is something like that our immune deficiency is discovered start antibiotic on a prophylactic basis culture directed vaccination involve immunologist immunoglobulin therapy and so on is required before a uh, definitive therapy for the crs otherwise you keep operating on those patients and ultimately the desired outcomes are never going to come so Sir, those are the conditions we must look into are the immunologists different from infectious disease specialist yeah immunologists are different different infectious disease specialists are different okay. immunologists are different it's a different subject yes immunologists are different infectious disease specialists are different another thing as i mentioned which complicates our uh, treatment is the biofilms in certain group of patients we always talk of biofilms how they complicate our course we must understand these are just aggregates of bacterial colonies which secrete a proteoglycan matrix around on the mucosal surfaces which protects them from the treatment by antibiotic by immune system or by anything and this the bacteria they exist in a different phenotype in a different you know mode and survives all antibacterial and other immunological treatment and keep on shedding bacteria and giving virulent infections so biofilms are very very complex situation the treatment is very difficult diagnosis is very difficult and they mostly there is some defect in the immune system which leads to the development of the biofilms so once how to suspect the biofilms number 1 we are treating some patient you are treating infection you have a culture directed antibiotic yet there is no improvement so you have to suspect biofilms on certain clinical grounds if you have a patient being treated in spite of the culture directed antibiotic not improving because culture is a very poor source of identification of bacteria in a particular you know infection culture can pick up one or two bacteria I, i ideally you need the you know different uh, molecular methods to identify the bacteria but what is clinically available is the culture in spite of the culture directed treatment if the patient is not improving culture negatives in spite of the repeated you know uh, clinical setting of the infections immunocompromised patients are the patient where the biofilms are prevalent and these are 
most difficult things to treat, most difficult things to diagnose, and the bacteria which are mostly responsible are either Staph aureus or Pseudomonas, and these are these conditions are most difficult, and mostly they you'll find them in the post-operative setting. You operate on a patient with sinus surgery, raw areas, the conducive environment for the bacteria to grow, and in spite of the various treatment, it is not improving because of the biofilms. And here comes the role of magic drugs, macrolides. Macrolides prevent the biofilm formation. If the biofilm is formed, they break the, you know, prevent the development of this proteoglycan shell. It breaks the proteoglycan shell and it works at various cells. So all these difficult patients start macrolides, particularly in the sinus disease. If you don't find anything, you know, uh, uh, concrete, you can start macrolides. And there are reasons for the biofilms why the antibiotics are not working because the shield, the proteoglycan shield itself prevents the antibiotic diffusion. It propels the bacteria, uh, anti uh, antibiotics back. And there are many, very mechanisms by means of which the antibiotics do not work on biofilms. And so you have to develop new strategies. There are many strategies. We work on it to combat the biofilm situation. Many times we see biofilms and in sinus surgery, these are the ways in our clinical practice we deal with the biofilms. Biofilms are most difficult. We have tried every, every possible thing, even baby shampoo and all those surfactants to shred off biofilms on the surface, but doesn't work. They have their own deleterious effect. And finally, we have resorted to two things. See, it is very difficult to identify because in clinical practice, there are no methods to detect biofilms. What you can get to know, yes, there are biofilms on the mucosal samples by, you know, uh, by the staining, by the gram staining, you can get to know there are some bacteria on the mucosal surface and which is in the clinical setting, which is not being treated by the antibiotics with the best available antibiotics means there are biofilms. Now, there are two options, either Staph aureus or Pseudomonas, which give resistant biofilms. In any of the culture, if Staph aureus comes, we start mupirocin washes. This is the most effective treatment for these biofilms. This is very, very expensive. Earlier, we but now we have got a new vendor by means of which we are buying mupirocin. Now the present cost of the mupirocin is three and a half lakh rupees for a kg. Kg salt of mupirocin, one kg salt of mupirocin costs three and a half lakhs. And the solution of mucurosin, if you have a, any kind of severe staph aureus infection, even two or three washes with topical washes of mupirocin will wash away the biofilms like anything, like magic. And it works like magic. Any severe MRS or whatever step or yes infection, if you use topical mipirocin, it works like magic. Similarly, we use Manuka honey, which we acquire from New Zealand for all these biofilms and difficult wounds and difficult. Irrespective of the culture, the Manuka honey works at every single microbe or any single you know pathogen on the planet. So Manuka honey is um, uh, something we acquire from the New Zealand nowadays. And this is very, very important. You can also acquire uh, online this Manuka honey, and this is the lab approved by the FDA for the you know medicated Manuka honey. So this is simply honey, like any other honey. This is a special honey, you know, produced uh, uh, in a nectar period in the New Zealand on those particular by the particular bees, which has a high methyl glyoxyl content. This is something which is lethal to every microbe on the planet. This is something or any severe infection, use topical manuka. In the nose, we pack manuka honey, you know, uh, in the form of packs manuka honey for 24 hours or so. And it takes away the infection like magic, which is not being treated by any given antibiotic. But these biofilms are not treated with the antibiotic. Even if you use 1000 time concentration, it doesn't work. And manuka honey works like a magic and you can cure these patients very easily. So... Manuka honey, sometimes silver we use, silver sprays we tried, we have stopped now because of the irritant effect, but yes, it is good for initial infection. You can use silver sprays, it are, these are available online, you can buy. Probiotics have a big role, I am coming to it as a microbiome concept, and you can, there are a lot of work is going on targeting things. So, pseudomonas infection, mainly in the nose, if you get 100 times culture, 95% of the time you'll get Staph aureus as a virulent organism if there is virulent infection. Only in rare situations, Pseudomonas you will get. 
So never direct directly any antibiotic directing pseudomonas. This is very important because we give, we have to give antibiotics sometimes in the post-operative setting or any setting. We rarely give antibiotics directing pseudomonas except in these conditions which is mostly either diabetic patient, immunocompromised patient, cystic fibrosis patient, or revision cases where the pseudomonas biofilms are common because that gives you a conducive atmosphere for the pseudomonas to grow. And in those situations, you have to direct the treatment according to pseudomonas. These are silver sinus sprays, which are available online, and they work very well. Uh, they are very, very effective, cost-effective as well, and you can use in certain situations. Osteitis. This is another severe form of disease probably we have a case uh, tomorrow see this kind of osteitis what is osteitis until now what we have been discussing is the mucosal inflammation this is inflammation which has gone beyond the mucosa to involve the bone as well directly or indirectly indirectly by means of knee osteogenesis or something or directly by means of infiltrating the bone so bone becomes the depot of these inflammatory cytokines and whatever times you operate these patients then, they're not going to work unless you remove the underlying bone. And that is one of the most difficult aspects as it preferentially involves the moid septations and you have to radically remove these. Radically means if you leave the bone, you're leaving the cytokine depot inside. Your steroids are not going to work. Topical steroids have their limitation to penetrate there and the disease is going to come back again and again. And these are the most difficult patients to treat unless you remove all these bones radically containing all these cytokines um, there as a depot. So macrolide again has a big role as they prevent the fibroblast turning into osteoblast and prevent this kind of osteitis formation. Most of these patients with osteitis almost always have biofilms. Biofilm induces severe aspect of the disease, bringing in more cytokines, more eosinophilic and more that kind of material to give a severe aspect of the disease. So this is another severe aspect of the disease. If you come across a situation, must be prepared to deal with, with more extensive, you know, treatments. As far as therapies, uh, uh, we discussed, we have limited, you know, armamentarium as far as the medical treatment is concerned. But there are lots of, you know, treatment you must have seen in the prescription. People have a habit of giving antifungal, habit of giving mucolytics, decongestant, antihistamine. None of these have any role practically on the management of CRS. CRS, as we have discussed, is an inflammatory disease driven by certain cytokines and antihistamine decongestant mucolytics, they have hardly any role, no role. Then now what new drugs have come in, which can be used in adjuvant drug therapy? This is something to discuss. Those adjuvant therapies, you know, which can help improve our overall outcome as far as the medical treatment is concerned. Because by and large, we have only steroid as an important medical treatment in our basket so far. So other drugs like antihistamines are reserved to control the symptoms of allergy, not for CRS. What I mean to say, antihistamine means they competitively bind to the histamine receptor. Now, where does the histamine come from? By means of allergen. When the allergic reaction happens, it binds to the IgE, IgE degranulates the mast cells and mast cells release the histamine. And that histamine release in the circulation gives symptoms. Antihistamines by competitively attaching to the or blocking the histamine receptor makes the histamine not binding to the antihistamine receptor. And you can treat the symptoms of allergic rhinitis. That's it. It has no role in the overall management of allergic rhinitis. doesn't modify the course of allergic rhinitis. Just treat the symptomatology of allergic rhinitis by means of competitively binding the histamine receptor, which is making uh, making the histamine receptor not available for the antihistamine, uh, for the histamine to bind. That's the role of antihistamine. Leukotrienes have a big role in AERD and in lower airways, not in regular CRS. And immunotherapy obviously has a main role in uh, allergic rhinitis. The only treatment in allergic rhinitis which can modify the course of allergic rhinitis is immunotherapy. So all those patients having allergy, 
must be subjected to skin prick testing and desired immunotherapy for that. So these otherwise have no role in clinical practice to bring in all these drugs for uh, you know any treatment. Antifungals, hardly any role as I've already uh, mentioned, except in certain situations when you have impending complications, you have a severe you know, fungal disease, like we have a patient today who developed, you know, slight vision loss day before and we have kept on antifungal and steroid for today. To buy the time, to reduce the inflammatory load, you can use all those patients and antifungal, otherwise hardly any role. In post-operative situations also, sometimes in diabetic patients where you can't use all the steroids and all that. In steroid-resistant cases, sometimes as a rescue treatment, you can use antifungals otherwise antifungals have hardly any role there is no point in prescribing antifungal for non invasive sinusitis or any kind of fungal sinusitis now what can be instituted as an adjuvant therapy in the recent time what we have discovered from this literature and this has become a important part of our prescription nowadays our prescription doesn't contain any of these for the CRS management by and large. Our prescription contains now which are the drugs which modifies the immune system, which has an impact on improving the overall immunity, which has an impact on improving the sinonasal immunity, and which should be the part of the prescription now. So microbiome, to understand this, we need to understand the human microbiome. Human microbiome means, you know, our body contains more bacteria than the human cells. We are 10 times bacteria than human cells. For each human cell, we have 10 bacteria in our body. And most of them are residing in the intestine. Trillions and trillions of bacteria. Those are good bacteria which are in, you know, uh, constant relationship with the body to maintain the homeostasis. Anything which improves the bacterial symbiosis or bacterial, you know, numbers in terms of numbers, in terms of diversity, in terms of even as the various species of bacteria, anything which improves has a positive impact on the overall immunity as well as cyanonasal immunity. So there are certain drugs which effect, which has an effect on improving the microbiome as an overall impact on overall improving the overall immunity. Antibiotics, whenever you use, we must not use broad spectrum antibiotics. There has been, you know, the trend using broad spectrum antibiotic covering any infection coming in the vicinity it will be taken care of. We should use narrow spectrum antibiotic. We should not suppress the good bacteria. We have to suppress the pathogenic bacteria, not the good bacteria. And we should use narrow spectrum culture director antibiotic rather than broad spectrum antibiotic. If you reduce the good bacteria, the immunity will suppress and the overall results will be poor. So all those things which are a deleterious effect on microbiome composition, which is basically formed in the infancy by means of lots of issues. You know, recently a study was done on so many things the studies are done. On the birth process, those who have vaginal delivery, those children who have a, you know, a cesarean delivery have a different microbiome because the microbiome the which child acquires during the birth process is who is, who is exposed to the microbiome during the birth process has a significant impact on numbers of good bacteria in the intestine. And those have a good immunity, overall good immunity, as compared to the cesarean delivered children. So this microbiome is formed in the initial first year of life. It is affected by lots of diet and other factors, by nutritional factor, by environmental factor, so many other factors. And this can be modulated. So the now the present concept is to improve the immunity by means of modulating the microbiome. So those drugs which have a effect on improving the microbiome should be included in the prescription to improve the overall immunity. And those are probiotics, prebiotics, and postbiotics. Probiotics we give in the prescription as a live bacteria. In numbers, in billions of probiotics we give, which add on to the good bacteria in, in the intestine and improve the overall, you know, uh, immunity. Prebiotics are basically non-digestible material for the bacteria to you know, as a substrate for the bacteria to grow and that improve the concentration of good bacteria. So it is prebiotic is not bacteria, but a, a digest non-digestible concentrate as a good substrate for the bacteria to grow. 
and increases the concentration of good bacteria. Postbiotics, postbiotics are bacterial substrates which has an impact on the immunity and these three things have an overall good impact on the immunity. Overall immunity, not only overall immunity but the cyanogenesis immunity also. So probiotics have been proven to have lots of effect on the immune system by exerting various mechanisms and in even in the cyanonasal system, they have a huge impact on improving the overall immunity and we must include probiotics in our, you know, in our overall treatment once we think of improving the immunity by various means and the probiotics is one of the uh, major ways. We have seen the cascade and it improved, you know, it works at the various level of the cascade to improve the overall inflammation. Postbiotics are known viable and one of them has been very popular. The uh, Bronchovex one, we know the OM85. This is the, basically the bacterial lysate of eight common bacteria. These are the end protects metabolites of the bacteria, which has an impact, good impact on the immune system. And these are the future. These are the future. And we have now have a policy to include them in our prescription to improve the overall immunity, to prevent recurrent infection, to you know, improve the overall immune conditions. It, it improves the immu innate immunity, adaptive immunity, every level by various mechanism and should be included in the prescription to improve the overall status because they work by various level at the molecular level to improve the overall immunity. Another drug which has been again uh, described as a wonder drug to improve the immunity as an immunostimulant is pedotti mode. Not only for infection, for allergy, for many, many things, it works at the molecular level to improve the immunity. And these are the drugs should be part of our prescriptions for the, you know, overall, all these uh, immune disorders when we think of managing these immune disorders. So, they decrease the repeated infection by various means. They decrease the, uh, uh, modulate the immunity by various means. They have an anti-allergic effect by various means, including reduction of the Ig and various things. And this should be given as a two-month treatment. Uh, is approved for the children as well as the result and have amazing effect on the overall immunity, particularly in children like all those adenoid patients treated, having all repeated adenoid you know, allergy, immunity, infection, so many things. And these are the good candidates for Pedotti mode as a primary treatment to improve the overall immunity. So these are the drugs, possible drugs, which can modulate the immune system and immune improve the immune system. So besides the steroid, these are the things which can be used in a, you know, adjuvant therapy rather than antihistamine, anti, you know, all those things are not required. These are the drugs which modulate the immune system. Anything which modulate, these are all, Antioxidant, besides their anti-inflammatory, anti-mucolytic activity, these are strong antioxidants. Resveratrol is one of the strongest, you know, antioxidants on the planet after nanocurcumin. Resveratrol is found in red grapes and the con highest concentration is in the red wine. More than the red grapes because it is more concentrated there. And this is one of the, I would say, after the nanocurcumin, one of the strongest antioxidants and has been reserved and proven in the American literature as an anti-cancer drug as it works at the, you know, various receptor level to uh, prevent the cancer formation and block the cancer forming pathways. So similarly here, it has an anti, you know, inflammatory effect in the sinonasal cavity also. And particularly we use in cystic fibrosis patient from day one as it has a lot of effect. You know, in AERD also it has a big effect by means of reducing the interleukin level. So resveratrol is one of the I would say therapy, adjuvant therapy, which we can consider, um, uh, you know, as an adjuvant therapy for various pathologies. Uh, what is the time you are going to take break? Elkem, anybody from Elkem? There was a tea break uh, supposed to be. Anybody? Nobody from the Elkem here? What time is the tea break? Will you please let me know? We have a 10 minutes tea break. We can take any time. Because now this is a very important part of the section before we start the live surgery in the afternoon. Understanding various endotypes of CRS. CRS is not a single disease. The 
disease with huge wide spectrum and now is the time of precision medicine every disease under type endotype has a different underlying pathophysiological process and there are variety of endotypes if we reach for the diagnosis of particular endotype we can tailor our therapy accordingly we can tailor our surgical treatment accordingly we can tailor the extent of surgery accordingly and we can tailor or find the need of biologics accordingly in those cases for the particular endotype so these are basically reserved for the severe crs type 2 crs or eosinophilic driven crs so how to pick up those patients what are the candidates of difficult you know uh, therapy difficult treatment which need lot of other adjuvant therapies and biologic therapies and all that these are the patients with bilateral polyp with allergies they have taken or needing more and more steroids for the treatment comorbid asthma earlier history of surgery severe tissue eosinophilia have loss of smell loss of smell is one of the symptom signifies severe disease or signifies eosinophilic disease why i'm saying so loss of symptom smell can be because of two reasons one is conductive loss we have polyps and it blocks the air to reach the olfactory receptor and the patient doesn't perceive the olfaction you remove the polyp it improves second is because of the inflammation and loss of smell which doesn't improve so easily is mostly because of eosinophilic toxin activity which affects the olfactory mucosa eosinophilic toxins have deleterious effect on the mucosa what time ready so next uh, after this slide we'll have a tea break and then we'll reassemble so eosinophilic toxins have a deleterious effect on olfaction and those are the patients who are difficult patient who have more severe disease more severe inflammatory profile and they need a severe treatment uh, you know extensive treatment for that so these are the tests to identify severe disease patients and accordingly we have to target those patients so there are variety of endotypes and each endotype has a different underlying pathophysiology each requires a different treatment different post surgery treatment like afrs is pure allergic which require post surgery you know steroid therapy oral as well as topical steroid therapy since the allergy is the cause it requires post therapy immunotherapy allergic testing and immunotherapy aerd is a different because of the aspirin sensitivity because of the cox1 inhibition the leukotrienes are over produced and you need anti leukotriene therapy aspirin desensitization presentation of all these patient is same polyps but the underlying pathophysiology is different if these patients are not desensitized you can treat 100 times they are going to come back so every endotype has a different pathophysiology cystic fibrosis has a different pathophysiology odontogenic sinusitis has a different pathophysiology pediatric sinusitis is a different pathophysiology you can't treat all these on the same line of steroid treatment or same line of surgical treatment the extent of surgery is different different kind of patients and the post operative treatment is different so we will now discuss the endotypes of crs after the break thank you so much for your attention
क्या नाम है उसका
So, to carry forward this discussion about CRS, we move on to this very, very important aspect of understanding various CRS endotypes. As I said, CRS is not a single disease. It is a multifactorial disease and various endotypes have various underlying pathophysiological processes. We need to pick up and diagnose a particular endotype so that we can direct or tailor our therapy according to that to get the best results. Like, for example, if you go one by one, one of the commonest endotype is allergic fungal rhinosinusitis. As the name implies, the etiology is allergy. Earlier was a discussion, can allergy contribute to CRS formation? And this is a live example. This is mainly because of allergy to some fungal antigen. We are exposed to fungus, which is ubiquitous in the air. And if fungus, inhaled fungus, happens to get trapped in one of the sinuses, and if person is allergic to that particular fungus, then the body's immune response creates this kind of phenomena. This is purely over-immune response by the body to some fungal antigen which the person is allergic to. And moment the fungus is trapped in the sinus, the eosinophilic activity comes into action. And this entire phenomena is produced by the eosinophils which secrete a lot of mucus, a lot of toxins, cytokines around the fungus and given this, give this classical picture of this allergic fungal rhinosinusitis. So start with my voice. This is a classical picture of allergic fungal sinusitis, which is defined as one of the criteria by the Bento Kuhn for diagnosis of this disease. So this is pure allergic, where the fungus is trapped and the eosinophilic comes around because of the allergy to that fungus. And this classical picture with fungus in the middle and all around allergic mucin, blocking the sinus, expansion of the sinus because of the non-drainage of the sinus, because of the blockage of the mucociliary activity and this vicious cycle starts and gives this kind of a terrific bony erosions all around and this kind of a picture which looks like an invasive fungus which is actually not an invasive fungus. It is not invading the mucosa. It is because of the volume of the material, the fungus and the surrounding mucin which is giving rise to this kind of a picture. And that these patients have classic nasal polyposis. Most of the time, these patients are young patients. They are not immunocompromised. Mostly disease to begin with is unilateral and then it can become bilateral as well. And there is always a controversy. If there is unilateral, we need to treat bilateral or not. There is never a treatment for, uh, I mean, the treatment is not required for uninvolved soil as nowadays we give post-operative irrigation to prevent disease coming to the other side. And there are lots of fungus, particularly aspergillus, which is involved in the causation. And this kind of a picture, this is pure allergic and this requires a dedicated treatment. This is one of the common endotypes. We have the first case today uh, we have posted is a allergic fungal rhinosinusitis in a child, unilateral disease. This disease where the fungus is acting as an antigen is a pure surgical entity. See, you will see all these endotypes have a different pathophysiologic process which is underlying and requires a different treatment. For this particular endotype, there is no role of medical treatment because fungus is acting as an antigen and we need to remove antigen. The moment we diagnose this disease, there is no point in wasting time for the medical treatment. There is no maximum or med uh, adequate medical management for this. The only treatment is surgical. This is pure surgical entity. And the aim of surgery is multi-pronged. The main aim is to remove this allergic fungal material. The fungus which is trapped in the mucin, along with the mucin, everything has to be extracted out. Removed and give wide, wide openings. Since this is a pure type 1 hypersensitivity, like any other type 1 hypersensitivity phenomena or pathology, Steroid is the answer. 
And for this problem, steroid is the mainstay of treatment. Postoperatively, as we give the wide, wide opening, which gives good introduction of the steroid deep into the sinuses. So steroid should be introduced deep into the sinuses postoperatively, which is the mainstay of treatment. And that's why in surgery also, this is one disease where we need to give mega, mega openings. See, in every endotype, according to the requirement of the postoperative treatment, we have to choose our surgical extent as well. In this particular patient, we have to give mega, mega enterostomies because they need lifelong surveillance. The patient is always allergic. Once he is allergic, he is always allergic unless it is cured by the postoperative immunotherapy. So all these patients being allergic, they require postoperative immunotherapy as well as. And we give after two, three months, we get skin prick testing done and accordingly, whatever fungal alternaria or something which requires an immunotherapy. And that is the only cure for these patients. Otherwise, they re they require long-term or even lifelong steroid rinses because the moment you stop, again, the fungus can get trapped and again, the same phenomena can start. So they have a high recurrence unless they are followed up long with a long-term steroid therapy and long-term surveillance. And in order to do long-term surveillance and introduce the steroids, we need to create wide, wide entrostomies. So these are the classical allergic fungal rhinosinus, rhinosinus patients and they require this kind of a full house phase for the reasons I mentioned and we use hydro debrider. This is the only condition where the hydro debrider is a value, has a big role. Hydro debrider is nothing but a water jet attached to the debrider. So that water jet, jet which has the ability to rotate 360 degree can flush this entire antigenic material 360 degree from the sinuses. The reason being, if you leave the fungus behind, leave this antigenic material behind, the same phenomena will come back and whatever, whatever you have done can result into failure. So you have to remove each and every bit of fungal material which is actually acting as an antigen. So this is a particular endotype which requires a particular kind of therapy and post-operatively irrigation and immunotherapy and practically no role of antifungals. There is always a confusion by people to start antifungal for these patients. Practically, there is no role of antifungal in this. This is non-invasive disease. Fungus, antifungal has some role in situation post-operatively in recurrences, diabetic patient where oral fungal cannot be given, as a st oral uh, steroid cannot be given. Antifungal is given as a rescue treatment for the steroids. So that's the only uh, place for the antifungals in these place, in these diseases. Otherwise, steroid is the treatment of choice. So this is allergic fungal rhinosinusitis. Anybody has any doubts, any query, or any suggestion, please feel free to interrupt me any point of time. This second endotype is aspirin exaggerated respiratory disease. If we see the spectrum of CRS from the lowest to the highest level of inflammatory spectrum, AERD is the highest inflammatory spectrum, which gives highest inflammation because of the massive leukotriene formation. And we need to understand this pathophysiology so that we can accordingly, accordingly direct our treatment to the pathologic process which is going on, which has led to this kind of AERD. So AERD is what? Aspirin exaggerated respiratory disease. These are patients who have nasal polyposis and asthma and have associated hypersensitivity to the COX-1 inhibitors, aspirin and other COX-1 inhibitors. So the moment you give COX-1 inhibitor to these patients, what happens normally? See what is happening at the molecular level. Normally when our cells degrades, the arachnoid acid in the cells is, you know, degraded by the cyclooxygenase enzyme to the prostaglandin, which are anti-inflammatory agent. Since it is a COX-1 inhibitor and the patient is sensitive to it, the cyclooxygenase activity is aborted and these prostaglandins are not formed, which leads to stimulation of lipoxygenase pathway, which leads to abundance of leukotriene formation. More leukotriene receptors, more leukotriene formation happens to occur and leukotrienes are massive allergic or inflammatory diverse and leukotriene formation once happens to occur, 
they lead to various activities on the mucosa, on the mucus gland, mucosa. They bring in lots of cytokines, TS2 cytokines, IL-5, IF-13, eosinophil. They activate mast cell, basophils, and create the highest level of, you know, inflammatory uh, process they orchestra in the entire epithelium, not only sinonasal, but the lower airway as well. And this gives the highest spectrum of inflammatory disease which present as a nasal polyp. Now, if you are unaware of the, that kind of nasal polyp with this kind of underlying pathophysiology, whatever surgery you do, it is going to go waste unless this pathologic process is completely taken care of. We need to stop this pathway of leukotriene formation. Otherwise, whatever number of time you operate, the patient is going to come back. And these patients, because of the massive leukotriene infiltration, have a particular hyperplastic mucosa. When you are operating on a uh, AERD, you can, by feel of mucosa, you can diagnose that this is a patient of AERD. They have a thick hyperplastic mucosa as compared to the other polypo patients. So, how can you diagnose these patients? Any patient who is having polyposis, having asthma, the guidelines are to test for the aspirin if they are sensitive. So, all patients of polyps and asthma must be tested for aspirin sensitivity. They have a, uh, you know, massive inflammatory level at the mucosal level because of all these cytokines, particularly leukotrienes, which form in abundance. And the treatment is directed at the inflammatory process. Directed at the inflammatory process means the thing which works maximum at the inflammatory, underlying inflammatory pathology, steroid again. So you have to do full house fast and introduce high doses of steroids since the eosinophils are in abundance. This is one of the endotype which has the highest eosinophil count in the mucosa and we have to give long courses of steroids, oral and sometimes, you know, in between oral along with the topical steroid and for the steroid to introduce in these patients deep into the mucosa, deep into the sinuses, all these patients require biggest sinusotomies. All these patients primarily require a draft 3. Open up all frontal sinus floor completely for the, you know, steroid to go deep into the sinuses. All AERD patients primarily require a draft 3. Primarily require a mega middle medial entrostomy. Primarily require a mega uh, sphenoid sinusotomy. A sort of nasalization procedure where you can introduce the steroid uninhibited deep into the sinuses because they represent the highest inflammatory spectrum. So again, every endotype directs a different kind of surgical treatment as well. Like AERD, this is a more inflammatory process, more severe inflammation, and this requires a bigger, bigger sinusotomies for steroid to introduce into the deep into the sinus. The medic, as far as the medical treatment is concerned, if you look at the pathway of pathogenesis, say this, the lipoxygenase is stimulated to form the leukotrienes. And leukotrienes act on the leukotrienes receptors. And similarly, the treatment is directed to block the 5 lipoxygenase by means of Xyluton. Xyluton is not available in India, but we have acquired twice for a patient from abroad. There's a very expensive drug. And secondly, the leukotriene receptor inhibitors, which are quite common in practice, that is Montelukast and all, and that is very, very important to competitively inhibit the leukotrienes to act on the leukotriene receptors because the leukotrienes are formed in abundance as well as the leukotriene receptors and the Montelukast has a big role. This is one endotype where the Montelukast has a key role. Otherwise, there is no point in giving Montelukast for any CRS patient. This is such an important understanding of endotyping. Every endotype has a different pathophysiology process, and this endotype requires Montelukast as a key treatment, key medical treatment, post-operative treatment. And all those diets, salicylate diets, and all those which form leukotriene formation, which favors leukotriene formation, should be avoided. This is one endotype when the, if the patient drinks alcohol, will show severe reaction like takes aspirin because the alcohol inhibits the leukotriene degradation and the patient develops within half an hour or hour a severe reaction like the intake of the aspirin, 
like aspirin, the patient is sensitive to aspirin, the same kind of reaction is exhibited by intake of the alcohol. And this is one of the ways so many times these patients are, they present and they are diagnosed. They are severely, you know, allergic to alcohol as it precipitates the aspirin-like reaction in those patients. So, for the improvement, the salicylate diet means all those dry fruits, spices, all should be avoided to prevent leukotriene formation. Alcohol should be avoided. And resveratrol as a key drug. This is one place where we use from day one all these patients resveratrol which inhibits 5-lipoxygenase as well as leukotriene formation. So this is a very, very important endotype. Now we have more than 400 patients wherein we have desensitized with the aspirin. This is one pathology which requires the reversal of the endo, the same pathophysiology, what it has, um, you know, started with. The pathophysiology started with the cyclooxygenase blockage and lipoxygenase abundance. And the same pathophysiology should be reversed and that is possible by means of aspirin desensitization. And these patients should be thoroughly, you know, uh, convinced for the aspirin desensitization, which should take place after the surgery. Because you have to start aspirin in those patients, so it has to be done after the surgery. Otherwise, you cannot operate upon those patients. And once the inflammatory load is minimum, that time the uh, desensitization should be taken place. So our ideal point for desensitization is a couple of weeks after the surgery, once the mucosal is and all that. As far as the painkillers are concerned, since the COX-1 has a reaction, COX-1 precipitates this entire reaction. As far as painkillers are concerned, the COX-2 inhibitors can be given, atoricoxib, selecoxib can be safely given to these patients. Even the paracetamol can, you know, st stimulate the same kind of reaction in high doses. So we should avoid all these. Only atoricoxib is one of the best drug as a painkiller for these patients. So aspirin desensitization has a key role to treat these patients. Otherwise, any number of times you can operate, they are going to come back because the underlying pathophysiology is leukotriene formation and that has to be reversed and that can be reversed in the same way that the patient is sensitized to the aspirin, it has to be desensitized to the aspirin and that aspirin desensitization is a key method. It can be risky, it has to be done in a, in a dedicated setup and we have a, a you know, an, a tie up for this with our intensive care unit with the pulmonologist whenever we do these patients, we have to counsel a lot because it's a very, very tedious process which can precipitate a severe bronchospasm or any kind of reaction which is the hallmark of this pathology because you have to give aspirin to those patients. So first of all, many times the question comes to the diagnosis. Like somebody asked me just now how you diagnose these patients. So you can diagnose by the history. All poly patients having asthma must be thoroughly assessed if the patient many a time gives history that he is allergic to painkillers, otherwise, even if he gives history, you have to test and we do SPT, skin prick testing. There are many ways otherwise to test this aspirin sensitivity. You can give oral aspirin, but that is very, very risky. It can be given in the ICU setting because the patient can develop a bronchospasm, severe bronchospasm, can be given with a inhalant aspirin or can be tested by a blood test. Nowadays, we are getting that test done, that is the best way, even you don't have to do SPT. Since leukotrienes are formed in abundance, we get urinary leukotriene levels done. And in these patients, they have significantly elevated urinary leukotrienes, which are not elevated in other any other kind of CRS or any other pathology. So, by simple blood test of elevated urinary leukotriene, you can diagnose this disease without doing any other test. That is the simplest way of diagnosis this disease. And once you diagnose this, even if you operate such patients, you have to tell them this is the most difficult condition. Your surgery needs to be revised if you don't sensitize, desensitize. And when surgery is taken, it has to be mega, mega entrostomies. This is, you know, the key concept of surgery in AERD patients. Bilateral draft 3, bilateral sort of medial maxillectomy, nasalization kind of surgery, which gives uh, a sort of, uh, you know, a deeper penetration of topical steroid when you introduce. So, once you diagnose with the aspirin challenge test, desensitization is a process where you need to admit the patient in the ICU for two to three days. And we do with our pulmonologist. There are criteria for desensitization. You have to 
block the severe reaction once you start aspirin. For desensitization, you have to start oral aspirin directly, which the patient is sensitive to and it can precipitate even the status asthmaticus. So you have to prime the patient uh, of desensitization process. You have to start Montelukast a week before to blunt the process of desensitization, to blunt the reaction of the desensitization process, the reaction of the aspirin. And uh, you have to test with a basic uh, force expiratory volume. It should not be very low, the patient, so the patient can sustain the bronchospasm, whatever happens to occur, or minimal bronchospasm with that. It should be done in ICU setting. And how it is done, there are many, many protocols. We do a three-day protocol, two days and one day extra stay. Means you have to start with a low dose of aspirin. We start with a 30 milligram. Reaction is bound to happen with a minimal 30 milligram. You have to be ready with all the measures for the nasal and the bronchial reaction with oral steroid or um, uh, even the epinephrine injection, whatever, and control it. And the moment once it is controlled, after three hours, you have to raise the raise the drug from 30 milligram to 60 milligram, then to 90 milligram every three hours, and the patient becomes, you know, uh, start sustaining the. Uh, aspirin very well without reaction. That is the classic, you know, phenomena of this aspirin tolerance, which is, happens to start after the increasing doses of aspirin. Once the patient start tolerating aspirin, next day you can raise to 150, 200, 300 milligram. In two days time, we bring it to 325 milligram. Once patient starts tolerating 325, you can further raise to 650 or whatever. But the moment patient starts tolerating aspirin, prostaglandin starts forming, leukotriene stop, stop forming, and the entire pathophysiology is reversed. So this is the classic of aspirin desensitization when the patient starts tolerating aspirin. When the patient starts tolerating aspirin, the entire pathophysiology is reversed. You don't need to operate these patients again and again. What all is required, the challenge is to sustain the aspirin for life because these patients require aspirin for life, life many times. We come across young patients. The last patient we did, uh, I saw him uh, yesterday, was operated one year before, had 17 surgery done earlier without the diagnosis of AERD. 17 times he was operated, then came, with, we operated again, sensitization. This has been one year now. He's on aspirin. We have reduced to almost um, uh, half the dose we started. Now he's on 150 milligram a day and doing well. Absolutely normal healthy mucosa. And that is what we require. So this is a very classical, you know, endotype of ARD, which requires a dedicated treatment. So every poly patient has a different endotype. We need to reach to the correct pathophysiological process to revert it or address it accordingly. So this is um, respirin sensitization, which is very, very important. Though it is contraindicated in certain settings, it cannot be done in all patients, particularly children, pregnant ladies, patients who have uncontrolled, unstable asthma. So severe asthmatic patient, you cannot take a chance of giving aspirin to, you know, precipitate status asthmaticus. And those are the most difficult patients, patient having already having aspirin problems like gastric ulcers, having bleeding disorders, and many other complications of aspirin already happening. And these are the patients you are not left with any other choice but to give biologics. These are the classic indications for monoclonal antibodies where you cannot desensitize the patient with the aspirin. So these are the classic indications. Otherwise, you keep either keep giving oral steroid or keep operating. You are not left with any other choice but to either desensitize or giving biological therapy. So these are the indications of biologics in the AERD patients, either those patients where the, it is not possible or where it is contraindicated or patient, in spite of the desensitization, they are not responding well. There are certain group of patients even not responding to aspirin. And many a times, such patients, we desensitize with the ibuprofen and sustain on ibuprofen. Ibuprofen is a good aspirin-like action and it is a good drug. Two of our patients, we have switched from aspirin to ibuprofen and doing well. So this is some time we can try. And those patients where you cannot operate again and again, you cannot do aspirin sensitization. These are the patients for biologics. They are most, most difficult category of 
patients, AERD patients, and we must be careful before treating these patients very much. Any questions? Then we move on to the next endotype. This is central compartment atopic disease, the newly introduced endotype. There's a very, we have a case uh, uh, probably tomorrow. This is again allergic. It's an allergic etiology. Why it is happening? When we inhale, if the patient is allergic to certain particles, you know, our when we inhale the air, the arc of air goes like that above the inferior turbinate, then towards the midline, towards the middle turbinate, posterior superior part of the nasal septum, and superior turbinate, then, then goes down towards the nasopharynx. So that when we inhale, the arc of air goes like this. Patient who is allergic, those particles are deposited in the central part of the nose. And central part means posterior superior part of the nasal septum, middle turbinate and superior turbinate, which actually act as a filter to prevent these particles going to the lower airway. So that is the area of central compartment where the disease starts. This is the kind of picture where the lateral compartment is free. Lateral sinuses are free. Though it can progress, the disease ultimately progresses to involve and block the ostium of the lateral sinuses and involve everything. Otherwise, to begin with, the disease starts in the central compartment and then keep on progressing, progressing laterally to involve the lateral compartment and sometimes it becomes a complete whiteout. So this is a central compartment disease where the allergic phenomena is the main role. Starting disease polyps in the central compartment and progressing in the periphery. This is classical of CCAD and allergy is the main cause of this disease. And since the disease affects the central compartment and involve the inflammation early in the course involve the median part of the olfaction, many of these patients primarily present with the olfaction loss. Though they are the olfaction loss is not that severe like any other eosinophilic sinusitis. And most of the times, these patients we have seen in the skin prick testing almost always are dust mite allergic. Because perennial dust mite allergy, which is giving constant exposure to these allergens all the time throughout the year, leads to this kind of problem in the central part of the uh, uh, nasal cavity or the sinonasal compartment. So it's a localized inflammatory res response in the central sinonasal compartment, which is exposed to the inhaled and ambient air. And the treatment is very, very simple. Out of all endotypes, this is the most favorable outcome because you need to treat the central compartment and open up the uh, sinuses all around. All sinuses have normal mucosa. They are not affected by any inflammatory process. The inflammatory process is directed to the central part and then follow up with the post-operative steroid irrigation and allergen immunotherapy. These are the candidates for pure allergen immunotherapy and they have the best outcome as compared to the previous two endotypes, the AERD and, you know, other endotypes. So central compartment atopic disease is a favorable disease, requires a proper diagnosis. You have to be vigilant. And once you put the endoscope, you'll see the, uh, you know, polyps in the central compartment over the middle turbinate, posterior superior part of the septum, and then progressing laterally. So these are classical patients of CCAD, and the, they are the good candidates for surgery and post-operative treatment in immunotherapy. Another endotype, which is mostly overlooked, not uncommon, this is non-polypoidal sinusitis. And this is very interesting, as most of the time we miss this, the dentist miss this, and patient, you know, present later on, this is odontogenic sinusitis. Sometimes the diagnosis is straightforward, patient has a problem, and the sinus problem along, and you put an endoscope and you see the purulent discharge in the middle meters and get a CT scan done and with a complete opacification of the ipsilateral maxillary sinus because it starts with the maxillary sinus in the, in the floor of which are the, uh, you know, molars and premolars. So it begins as a unilateral maxillary sinus disease with a dental disease in background and present as a sinusitis. And this is classic odontogenic sinusitis. And how you be suspicious about this in all unilateral maxillary sinusitis patient, particularly presenting with the purulence, or classical odontogenic patient, and that purul, foul, 
that uh, purulence is foul smell because mostly it is anaerobes which are involved in the pathogenesis of this kind of sinusitis because of the dental cause. And there is history of dental treatment, sometimes overlooked. Rather than the regular CT scan, we must get a cone beam CT scan done to see the dental, you know, underlying, you know, dental details because the regular CT scan doesn't give the fine details of the, you know, underlying dental pathology, which is best picked up by the corn beam CT scan. And corn beam will exactly tell you what is going on to the underlying, you know, dental region. There could be periapical erosion. Most of the time, periapical or, you know, uh, pulpal disease. And you'll see the tooth projecting inside, you know, the periapical, you know, ligament missing and the disease directly, you know, bursting from the periapical region into the uh, sinuses. So this is a, different disease, we have to be very cautious in unilateral patients presenting with maxillary disease and then it further progresses to involve the ethmoids and further on. But to begin with, it is maxillary and most of the time it is uh, periodontal or endodontic disease, sometimes associated with oroenteral fistula, then the diagnosis is very obvious without any doubts and sometimes post-dental implants as a foreign body which acts as a foreign body and can start the inflammation. So that is very complex in those situations to treat with. So odontogenic sinusitis, for the diagnosis, unilateral foul smelling with purulence in the middle meatus, gut a culture, you will find anaerobes and that establishes the diagnosis. So the treatment is an infective pathology. So treatment is obviously antibiotics, but in the presence of the dental disease, the antibiotics generally do not work. So you need to treat the cause, the dental disease. You have to diagnose the dental disease. You have to refer to the dentist, take the dentist's opinion, confirm the dental disease, and then according to the predominance, you have to treat. If the sinusitis is the predominant problem, you have to treat sinuses first and establish the ventilation and drainage, followed by the dental treatment. If the dental disease is prominent, obviously you have to treat the dental first or sometimes both together. Uh, sino, the sinus surgery and the dental work both together can be done. In cases of implants, the implant is a big problem acting as a foreign body and many times foreign body infection in the vicinity of the foreign body requires foreign body removal. But here, if the implant is not mobile, it is still fixed and there is not infection around the implant, still you can try a face and save the implant many a times. Otherwise, you have to explant that, you know, prosthesis to give a cure from the infectious disease to these patients. So this is a very important, you know, type of sinusitis, which is mostly overlooked, which is treatable. It has a perfect cure. This is the only type of sinusitis which we can say has a perfect cure as compared to the other one, but has to be diagnosed and treated properly. This is one of the most difficult one, deadly kind of sinusitis, particularly in children, cystic fibrosis, where the young, very young children present with bilateral nasal polyposis. The youngest one we have operated is one and a half year old. Bilateral massive nasal polyposis. And this is a different endotype in terms of certain different characteristics because it has a genetic problem behind where there is a mutation in a gene, cystic fibrosis, you know, transconductor gene, which leads to thick viscid secretion because of defective chloride transport. So the problem is genetic, which manifests in the nose because of impaired mucociliary activity. The secretions become thick and viscid and the sinus clearance doesn't take place so easily. And that the redundant secretions in the sinuses, the stagnant secretion, inviting infection, giving this kind of a problem. And these young children, poor children, they develop because the same problem happens in the lower airway and they have concomitant lower airway infections as well because of the impaired mucociliary activity and because of the nasal infection, the lower airway infections, you know, exaggerate. And mostly they have a limited lifespan but ultimately these patients require lung transplantation because of the repeated lower airway infection. And it is the upper airway infection which is deadly which is responsible for lower airway problem. Even after the post-transplant, the cause of death in all these patients 
is upper airway infection. So these patients have a limited lifespan and their entire lifespan evolves around control of infection in the upper airway. This is not eosinophilic disease unlike other endotypes of sinusitis. This is a pure neutrophilic driven disease, pure infective disease because of stagnant secretions. And the infection in this particular problem is almost always because of pseudomonas. And what we can give besides the medical treatment, there are lots of, you know, nowadays this uh, uh, drug modifiers are available, modifying this gene. Gene modifiers therapy is available. Very, very costly gene modifier therapy, but it's, yes, it's still it is available. But for the nasal treatment, what best we can do is a hypertonic saline rinses. See, we can use, normally we use in our sinus disease or post-surgery or whatever, isotonic saline. This is one place where the hypertonic saline is indicated because the ciliary activity is not working and you have to really need something to mechanically to bring out all the secretions. So hypertonic saline, wide, wide, you know, and trust me to give gravitational drainage as the ciliary activity is not happening. See, the infection is because of stagnant secretion. So the goal is to open up all wide sinus. The youngest child we have done bilateral medial maxillectomy is one and a half year old to give gravitational drainage and to introduce topical antibiotics. In other endotypes of sinusitis, which is driven by the eosinophil, we introduce steroids. Here steroids have hardly any role. It is the infection where the topical antibiotics have a big role. Since pseudomonas is the predominant pathogen, almost always the tobromycin washes are the mainstay of treatment post-operatively. So gravitational drainage, nasalization, remove everything. Fortunately, in young children, the frontal sinuses and sphenoids are not developed. It is on the maxillary and the ethmoids, and you can do a bilateral medial maxillectomy, remove the middle turbinates, and a sort of nasalization procedure for the gravitational drainage, and then introducing topical tobromycin and other hypertonic saline and all those things. Mucolytics, yes, strong mucolytics are in required, like Dornay's alpha is the strongest mucolytics, which is, uh, you know, uh, clears the degraded, uh, you know, DNA products and all that. So this is a very, very dreaded disease. Patients having limited lifespan. The entire lifespan is dependent upon control of upper airway infection. The moment upper airway infection is goes uncontrolled, the lower airway infection sets in and that is deadly. The cultures have shown the same bacteria in the upper and lower airway every time when you get done. Even in the post-transplant setting, the even a single upper airway infection can lead to a mortality in these patients. So these are young very difficult to treat patients and there is no other way than to do all this for these patients. Otherwise, the lifespan is limited. So this is cystic fibrosis. We have to be very careful about the management of this disease which presents in young children. Any young child presenting with bilateral polyposis should be considered cystic fibrosis until proved otherwise. This is such a common presentation as bilateral polyposis in youngest of the children. So this is how this disease present and this is how we have to be very suspicious about the diagnosis of this problem. Otherwise, if you overlook, can be deadly to the patient. Next endotype is the pediatric rhinosinusitis. Pediatric rhinosinusitis, unlike the adult rhinosinusitis, has different features. It is more complex than adult sinusitis. It is more different than a adult sinusitis for regions. Adult sinusitis is mostly eosinophilic. You have seen many endotypes driven by the eosinophilic mechanism and more difficult requiring biological therapy and all that in difficult situation. Pediatric is mostly neutrophilic dependent with abundance of lymphocytes. It is not predominantly eosinophilic disease. The problem, the complexity increases because of other associated problems in children. Children are more often allergic, more often immunocompromised, more often present with different, you know, um, overlapping symptoms. So their diagnosis is many a times very, very difficult. And children, their immune system is much deficient as compared to the adults. So all these problems add on to the complexity of diagnosis as well as overall management of pediatric 
sinusitis. Pediatric sinusitis never take lightly. The most difficult patient and many a times, in spite of all possible treatment, they are difficult to treat. In spite of not being an eosinophilic disease. And many a times, the sinusitis component is overlooked. I'll show you some of the CT scans. Overlook the reason being, we generally don't tend to get CT scan done in pediatric patients. They present with a, you know, non-specific problems like upper airway symptoms, any allergic or whatever symptoms, but they don't present with a classical triad of CRS symptoms. That's why we don't get a CT scan done and they remain underdiagnosed. Most of the time they are being treated on the line of URI, LRI, adenoids and on other things, on immunity and other things, and the sinusitis part remains underdiagnosed. So pediatric sinusitis, once it is diagnosed, their management is, as I said, is very complex. It's a neutrophilic driven disease. Most of the time you have to treat the infection. It is predominantly neutrophilic, requiring more and more, you know, besides the saline irrigation, allergic treatment, it is most of the time they are allergic, these children. Most of the time, it is the culture-directed antibiotic, which is the mainstay of medical treatment. And since you're, you're, you tend to avoid surgeries most of the time in children because of their complexity, you tend to, you know, you're more and more inclined towards the massive medical treatment to avoid surgery. And many a times, you need to give culture-directed even IV antibiotics and more and more immunomodulators like pediatric mod. I said, we give in almost all pediatric patients to modulate the immune system to improve the overall immunity in these patients to avoid surgical treatment. But once it comes to surgery, why? Once it comes to surgery, we tend to avoid the sinus surgery in pediatric patients for the reasons. There are many, many reasons to avoid, you know, um, uh, pediatric sinus surgery. There are lots of challenges as compared to the adults because, first of all, in spite of, by all means, the diagnosis is still under question. And there are lots of other systemic diseases also associated with. It's not a single disease, the sinusitis like adult where you can treat. And once it comes to sinus surgery, their anatomy is challenging. They are, you know, the critical structures are in vicinity, the orbit, skull base, they are in close proximity. The spaces are narrow. Even if you operate in the narrow spaces, the chances of giving sinic are more. And these patients, you know, the success of sinus surgery so in like any other sinus surgery the success depends upon the post-operative irrigation and in children which is very very difficult as you can't expect the children to cooperate in the same manner like adults for the post-operative irrigations so in children the you know the outcome of sinus surgery as compared to adults are poor and we have to be very much aware of this fact that in children, chances of overall outcome are poor. Yeah. So, when you take up the sinus surgery in children, you have to be very much aware of all these difficulties and should include in the counseling of all these patients because you can't explain expect that kind of form plans in, from these patients. So, once it comes to surgery, in spite of all maximal medical management in spite of all immunomodulatory allergic infection all treatment if the sinusitis pediatric sinusitis doesn't improve the role comes of surgery and once it comes to surgery the first surgery which should be undertaken is the adenoidectomy the reasons to believe this fact adenoids in the children harbors biofilms the recurrent infection in the you know in this upper area in the children leads to biofilm formations in the adenoid. The adenoid may not enlarge, but they develop biofilms and they release infection, infective bacteria. Because the same bacteria have been cultured every time you take from the adenoid or from the sinuses, the same bacteria which are responsible for recurrent sinusitis. So adenoidectomy is the cure for these patients many a time without doing a sinus surgery. So once it comes to maximal medical treatment, which is over, once it comes to surgery, the first line of surgery is the adenoidectomy. And if there is some collection in the maxillary or some other sinus, you can you do the sinus wash or middle metal antrosmy or whatever. Treat allergy. Balloon sinoplasty, we don't believe because it doesn't treat the, 
you know, pathophysiology of allergy. But in children, you can take up for a limited sinus involvement as it minimizes minimizes trauma to the sinuses that the children are not going to do any douching in the post-op. You can consider for limited maxillary sinus work in those situations. Otherwise, the FES is the answer for these problems. So, adenoids are the one need to be treated first before taking up for the sinus surgery. Direct sinus surgery is generally avoided in the children, not indicated, unless you have some indication. So, pediatric sinus surgery is when it is indicated. Like I said, once it fails or adenoidectomy fails, even after the adenoidectomy, if the condition doesn't improve the sinusitis persists, then you need to take up the sinus surgery. Otherwise, bypassing the medical treatment and the definitive sinus surgery from the beginning is indicated in allergic fungal sinusitis, which is predominant in the young children. Cystic fibrosis, like we discussed, if you have impending complications, most of the orbital complications happen to occur in pediatric sinusitis. Most of the orbital cellulitis, abscess, all orbital complications most likely happen to occur in pediatric sinusitis. And those are the indications for sinus surgery, irrespective of the you know, underlying pathology and the intracoinal poly. So these are the situations where pediatric sinus surgery has to be undertaken, irrespective of by you know, all odds you have to undertake the sinus surgery besides the fail of uh, you know, medical treatment and adenoidectomy. So we have to be very clear about the management of pediatric patient as these are always complex patients. This is the clip to show you something about the pediatric, you know, adenoidectomy. Our, uh, you know, proposition of adenoidectomy to these patients. Okay. This adenoidectomy, you know, the biggest indication for adenoidectomy is obstruction. Large adenoids are the biggest, you know, indication for the adenoidectomy. But believe me, in our practice, I tell you honestly, most of the adenoidectomy are done in not enlarged adenoids, you can say. Obstruction to me is a, you know, a lesser indication as compared to non-obstructive indication for adenoidectomy. There are two major non-obstructive indications for adenoidectomy. One is the CRS. Pediatric CRS, the adenoid may not be enlarged to the extent that blocking the nasopharynx, yet you need adenoidectomy to remove the biofilms from the adenoids to, you know, uh, cure the CRS. Now, the other one is the pediatric ear problems, autological recurrent OME, recurrent autological disorder requiring adenoid, which becomes the source of problem to the eustachian tube malfunction and other autological disorders. And those, both the times, the adenoids are not enlarged. So, enlarged adenoid is not always the indication. But once it comes to adenoidectomy, it has to be comprehensive. This is pure lymphoid tissue. It is not a tumor which is going to come back. Many times we hear the recurrence of the adenoid. The adenoid is not a tumor which can recur. It is a lymphoid tissue which enlarges in response to allergy and infection. The treatment of the adenoid should be comprehensive. Adenoidectomy is a part of treatment. It's not everything that you do adenoidectomy and forget about it. Adenoid treatment requires a concomitant treatment of allergy and whatever immunity and other disorders. If those are not treated, they can regrow. It is lymphoid tissue which can regrow. So this always, almost always requires an allergy and immunity treatment. But once it comes to adenoidectomy, it has to be comprehensive. And see, we use the coblator and micro debrider both together. The first stage, what you have seen just now was uh, uh, debulking by the micro debrider. This is the second stage wherein, you know, the micro debrider which is being used on the oral cavity side. Being used on the oral cavity side, the red 60 blade, the blunt edge facing behind the cutting edge anteriorly, wherein the entire adenoid tissue being lifted off the perimysium behind, protecting the perimysium. In spite of the little bit oozing going on, which is acceptable, but it's very important to prevent the underlying perimysium damage and the muscle damage. See this, the perimysium, the perimysium is one which protects muscle. If you injure the muscle, that's a disaster which invites lots of problems. All the problems of adenoidectomy related to the 
you know regurgitation nasal twang all those problem infection and all those happen to occur when the underlying muscle is injured if you i use the carburetor which can give you blood less feel but this is inevitable damage to the underlying perimysium and muscle you cannot protect anything and that is something undesirable so at this step use uh, this micro debrider not the carburetor Carburetor can be used at the end if there is any bleeding or bleeding point at the minimum minimum points rather than everything with that. Whatever. This is the third step where see this laterally hypertrophic adenoids behind the use taken tube. These are the important you know source of problems to the ear. In most of the autologic problems, these are the adenoids responsible for the use taken tube dysfunction and further inflammatory you know access to the ear. And these see this. You press on the perimysis behind and push your debrider and keeping the cutting edge under vision behind the use taken tube, you can completely remove the laterally hypertrophic adenoid without damaging under vision, without damaging the use taken tube. So see, there's a kind of adenoidectomy quickly. There's a comprehensive adenoidectomy preserving the under, underlying muscle perimysium use taken tube around with minimal use of pottery or carburetor. With the micro debrider, accepting little bit of the oozing in this patient to protect everything. So adenoidectomy is a, you know, primary. Once it comes to surgery, adenoidectomy is the first surgery for pediatric rhinosinusitis. And if it fails, then you have to think of, you know, a, a proper comprehensive sinus surgery in these patients, which is otherwise we are trying to avoid that for the reasons I mentioned. That these children are these children are never going to cooperate in the post-operative period for any douching or any sort of introduction of topical steroid or antibiotic inside the nasal cavity. So, having discussed everything, the biggest question is when to think of surgery, when, what is the end point of medical treatment? So, again, the same question exists and here brings our SNOT-22 scoring as the main. I told you that is a patient-centered decision-making. There's a shared decision-making between the patient and the uh, uh, doctor that in spite of the best given medical treatment your symptoms are not coming under control disease is persisting and you need to take a call of sinus surgery and this note 22 prevents you from getting into all problem as the patient is sharing in the decision making process that is most important so for uh, medic uh, by and large the limit of the medical treatment for the you know, the, this disease for the polypoidal and non-polypoidal for, for 8 to 12 weeks for topical treatment for the topical steroid for the polypoidal and macrolides and other antibiotics for the non-polypoidal and if still the disease persists, you have to take a call for sinus surgery. So that's the end point of the treatment considering 8 weeks, sometimes 10 weeks at the end point and if you still your symptom persists, your disease persists, you have to take a call for surgery. Except there are certain indications for direct endoscopic sinus surgery. These um, indications which I am uh, bringing forward are those where there is no role of medical treatment. The moment you see the case today, you can operate tomorrow, kind of a situation. And these are the direct indications of the first cases when the patient present with the impending complications. Patient, many a time, like uh, we have a case, I uh, told you about the AFRS case from day before, presented with a started vision loss and those are the impending cases where you don't need to wait for the medical treatment to come in effect and rather treating and preventing from complications. Fungus is a pure surgical entity. Fungus means you have to remove it. No drug is going to uh, you know, be effective on any non-invasive fungus. Fungus sometimes like in AFRS fungus acts as an antigen. In, even in non-AFRS fungal balls, you have to remove the fungus. That's the only answer to the fungus. There's no medical treatment for the fungal disease. By and large, allergic, allergic fungal sinusitis is odontogenic, no medical treatment. Now, the offending cause is, you know, dental pathology. You have to treat the sinuses as well as the dental pathology both without waiting unnecessarily wasting time for the medical treatment. Mucosils are pure surgical entity because of the obstruction of the sinus drainage without any inflammation inside. There is nothing or no inflammation like sinus disease or inflammatory process happens in CRS. So, mucosils are non anatomical variant this is very important sometimes you have to take a call early without wasting time on other things like many a time we get a patient with 
कौन सा बुलोजा और सम एनाटमिकल एबनॉर्मलिटी प्रीडिस्पोजिंग टू साइनोसाइटिस पेशेंट कमिंग फॉर द प्रेजेंटेशन विद द साइनोसाइटिस ऑफ कोर्स यू कैन यू नो रिजॉल्व द प्रॉब्लम अक्यूट प्रॉब्लम विद द एंटीबायोटिक एंड स्टीरॉइड बट इट इज समथिंग व्हेन देयर इज अ ऑफेंडिंग एनाटॉमिकल एबनॉर्मलिटी इट इज लाइकली टू कम बैक पेशेंट कमिंग बैक विद द सेम प्रॉब्लम यू कैन ट्रीट विद द मेडिकल ट्रीटमेंट अगेन एंड अगेन बट वंस देयर इज ऑफेंडिंग यू नो रीजन बिहाइंड इट एनाटॉमिकल वेरिएंट व्हिच इज प्रीडिस्पोजिंग इट इज बेटर टू uh you know treat such patient and those are good surgical candidate to give you cure this is gray area you can say polyps any polyp patient see again you have to take a call when to operate or where to operate or not polyp means this is a high end inflammatory disorder the inflammatory spectrum is too much particularly grade 2 3 polyp grade 2 3 polyp means polyp occupying the Entire middle meatus or polyps extending to fill up the sinus cavity to give nasal obstruction. These are the kind of polyp. By means of your medical treatment, means irrigation, doxycycline, you know, topical steroid. You can control the symptoms to some extent for time, but that is not going to give cure. You know, in hearts and hearts. So massive polyposis, you know, will require surgery at the end of the day. Now you have to take a call according. you are you know understanding with the patient to for the surgery now or later continuing with the medical treatment but ultimately they will require surgery so significant polyposis is a gray zone where you can take a call for the early surgery also because these are the surgical candidates ultimately their disease is not going to go off with the medical treatment only and these are the classic patients where you can take a call for early surgery also and this is very very important and to us also and in the western literature one of the biggest indication for the sinus surgery for us also for many other reasons patient even with a significant allergy with minimal sinus disease patient with sinus disease requiring oral steroids again and again to control their symptom many patient with massive allergy or massive you know with minimal sinusitis or minimal sinusitis on scan but it doesn't resolve without taking steroids so patients requiring oral steroids again and again is the indication for sinus surgery to prevent the need of oral steroid in the future now after the surgery once you open up the sinuses you give the ability for the topicals to go inside penetrate inside and avoid the need of oral steroids so in our practice now this is the biggest indication for the sinus surgery any patient requiring oral steroid again in the 3 months time has a inflammatory spectrum which requires a sinus surgery for the topicals to access inside and avoiding the need for oral surgery so any patient requiring twice at least oral steroid to control their symptoms in 3 months is the indication for the sinus surgery at least for future you can avoid the need for oral steroids by means of opening the sinuses and allowing the steroids to penetrate deep into the sinus because even the topical steroid in a minimal concentration what we use the bidonacide 0.5 mg a day minimal concentration up to 5% of this topical steroid is retained in the sinuses for some times unless it is expelled by the mucociliary activity and that works on the mucosa or with minimal systemic absorption without giving any side effect to work as a oral steroid without the need of oral steroid so that is one of the biggest indication for the need of sinus surgery in this patient for patient requiring uh, repeated oral steroids to control their symptoms so this is about decision making in sinus surgery before we start our uh, live session we can take questions now uh, we'll discuss the surgical and fine details later just i'll put forward some of the radiological uh, important things which are important from the surgical perspective what all to be seen i am not going to be going in the details of the radiological anatomy but certain things which has an impact how the radiology can influence a good outcome in those patients any questions meantime yes please significance of Yeah. 
W with polyp, S without polyp. It is considered like that. It has been used like before, since before, like this, what I mean. Sir, one more question. Excuse yes. me, sir. Excuse me. There is one more question. Yes, yes, please. Uh, I, I have a patient who is allergic to milk protein. He is just a three-year-old boy. And mm. uh, his father is a urologist. And he says as soon as uh, he takes some milk, he he's a known patient of allergic rant. His father is also having allergic rant. He's, now, how to proceed for this, uh, this patient? Allergy requires immunotherapy. Allergy is, uh, there is no definitive treatment for the allergy except immunotherapy. Uh, hello, sir. Um, Dr. Stephen here. Yeah. Sir. I was talking to uh, Dr. Mujinder. Uh, past two, three years, uh, he was talking about uh, sensitivity of the nose and uh, provided all post-op polyp or allergic granitis you go and do a videonurectomy. So I've been doing with a very successful rate. And uh, in the stock, I think, is not mentioned. Yes. So I'll show in one of the case a more, uh, you know, rather than videonurectomy, a yes. more endpoint approach is the posterior nasal neurectomy. Okay. That can be used as an adjuvant therapy for such patients, not as a primary therapy. So like all sinus patients who are concomitantly allergic also, simultaneously we do a posterior nasal neurectomy. Posterior nasal why why we didn't neurect me? Why posterior nasal neurectomy? Why this change? See, the postganglionic fibers to the nasal glands or the inferior turbinate glands or all this come through the BDN now. How come? The greater superficial petrosal now, which is a branch of facial now, it forms the VDL now in the VDN canal by joining the deep petrosal now. This VDL now come to the greater uh, sphenopalatine, uh, this um, sphenopalatine foramen region, this uh, pterygopalatine fossa, and joins the ganglion. From the ganglion, the postganglionic fibers arise, which supply the nasal and palatine glands. From ganglion, the fiber go to the eye also, lacrimal fibers. Now, before going to the ganglion, if you transect the VDN now, you sacrifice the lacrimal fibers also, which can lead to dry eye. So, the more focused treatment is to do a posterior nerectomy. The postganglionic fibers emerging after the spinopalatine ganglion, they come out of the this um, spinopalatine foramen and the perpendicular plate of the palatine bone into the nasal cavity. And that is the area where these filaments enter into the nasal cavity you can sacrifice. You apply your coagulator to that region and the fibers are automatically gone. So simple application of the coagulator in that region through which these fibers come out. I will show during live surgery. That region is between the posterior part of the inferior turbinate and the middle turbinate. From region of the sphenopalatine foramen, these fibers travel to the inferior turbinate. That area, in the, that fiber, those fibers travel in the mucosa. We don't need to look for those fibers. You don't need to do any dissection. Just ablate that mucosa automatically, you know, damages those fibers. So that is posterior nasal nerectomy. That can be used in adjuvant therapy to the allergic rhinitis patients also. Patients having concomitant allergies, all these CRS patients. So it doesn't need anything additional. You just need to coagulate that area. And it works on glandular activity. It works on glandular hypertrophy of the inferior turbinate. It works on neural allergic response, you know, giving the symptoms of congestion and blockage and all that of allergic rhinitis. Selectively, not everything. It's not a, uh, you know, allergic rhinitis is a medical disease, but all these symptoms can be taken care of by this selectively. Hello, sir. No, no. Aspirin exaggerated respiratory disease is not in patient taking aspirin. It's a disease in those, pa those patients, those people 
who are allergic to aspirin. So, we are giving desensitization by means of give, offering aspirin. We are desensitizing those are the patients who are as, allergic to aspirin. And because of being allergic to aspirin, the COX-1 pathway is inhibited and leukotriene pathway is activated. So in order to activate the COX-1 pathway, you have to desensitize. You have to start aspirin. These are not patients who are on aspirin. If the patient is taking aspirin, this cannot happen. Hello. This cannot happen. We are already protected from this. Sir. Uh, hello. hello, sir. Yes. Uh, one more question, sir. Please. Uh, uh, sir, you, regarding the odontogenic sinusitis, you told that uh, treatment right. phase plus uh, removal of the dental uh, removal of the dental treatment. So instead of the phase, if we do the go in enter into the maxillary antrum through the sublabial root and do a middle metal antrostomy, will it help? To the natural maxillary ostium. Uh, um, we are doing the middle metal antrostomy and we are treating because the entry during the odontogenic sinusitis, the main pathology lies in the root of the teeth yes. or uh, yes. Yes. pieces. So that area to reach with the endoscope will be a quite difficult area. That is not our domain. We are treating the sinusitis part. The dental pathology has to be treated by dentist. For sinusitis part, you have to open up the natural ostium of the maxillary sinus and remove the disease. And simultaneously, the dentist will take care of the dental part. One more question regarding that uh, aspirin uh, uh, thing. Uh, see, uh, aspirin is very, see, we use the aspirin most commonly for the cardiovascular disorder nowadays. So, the AERD group of patient, young patient, they are not taking aspirin or anything, no? They are not taking aspirin. I am not saying they are taking aspirin. They... This is a group of patients who are sensitive to aspirin. Like, suppose you are allergic to aspirin. Like any other drug, if you are allergic to aspirin, then can develop this kind of pathology. So, if you have CRS, if you have polyps, if you have asthma, if you are allergic to aspirin, then can precipitate this AERD. Not in the regular patient, everybody. Sir. Yes, so CRS patients having NSEID sensitivity are the patients who can develop AERD. Yes. Sir, kindly elaborate on the histopathological findings. Histopathology. Yeah. See, in histopathology, what you look for the parameters for the recalcitrant disease, refractory disease. And the two important parameters for the refractory disease, which guides you for the further aggressive long-term treatment. One is the mucosal eosinophilia. Your pathologist can easily tell you per how high power field, how many eosinophils are there. And the thickening of the subepithelial region, thickening of the subepithelial region dictates long-term, uh, you know, ongoing inflammation, severe inflammation. And these two things direct you for a long-term aggressive treatment. If you overlook, the patient is going to come back with a, uh, you know, recurrence. So, this is something you have to be vigilant about it. So, so, if they don't have CRS, if they're allergic, this nasal blockage is classically treated by posterior nasal neurectomy. That's why I told you that adjuvant therapy is basically to control the nasal glands. Turbinate is a, you know, vascular space, inferior turbinate is a vascular stroma and lots of goblet cells and glands. And those are controlled by the posterior nasal now. So those are the patients who are likely to be benefited by the posterior nasal neurectomy. Sir, sir, yeah, sir. Uh, you told about this neurectomy posterior nasal. Uh, 
Sir, under sir, we have been doing this after, in some of our patient after fest. Response was good. But sir, I want to ask about the procedure, the way we do it. So sir, we have been raising the flap, identifying the nerves, and then usually cutting. So See, there, there is no point in doing that exercise. Yeah. We know, we have done several times these cadaveric studies. How do these nerves come out of the pterygobeltine fossa? Right. There are two pathways through which these nerves come out. Yes. One is through the spinopalatine foramen, some of the branches along the spinopalatine artery. Right. And some of the nerve filaments through the perforation in the perpendicular plate of the palatine bone. Right. Now, if you are elevating the flap and identifying, you cannot identify each and every nerve filament. Right. So that one centimeter area, you have to cobblate. Assuming the entire nerves coming through that area. Okay. Sir. So once you ablate with the cobblator, the nerve fibers and all those are destroyed. You don't need to identify and pick and choose every nerve fiber to treat. Sir, one more query. Sir, in this cobulation method, is there any chance that these nerves again regain their... Yes, like... that can happen. Even after the transection, the regeneration can happen, but it is unlikely. Yes. Once you destroy the length of the nerve, yes. it is unlikely. Yes. Sir, uh, I have seen, sir, once they raise the flap, they even put something between so that these nerves do not again... Like yeah, yeah, I know. You raise the flap, you see some of the filaments coming. Right, sir. But still, you cannot count them. Yes, sir. You have to entirely, you know, ablate that area completely right. to remove yes. all the fibers, all the supply which is coming. And that yes. is very simple. Why yes, to raise sir. the flap and uh, do any exercise? It will it will take extra time. I, I will show you. Yes. And then half a minute, you can ablate the entire thing. Okay, sir. Thank you. Uh, hi, sir. Uh, good morning yes, to sir. you. Uh, sir, uh, my question is, uh, you were talking regarding biofilms on adenoids. Uh, could you just elaborate? It will really help us. So, yes. So, that is very important. That's how the concept of adenoidectomy has come in to treat the pediatric fess. See, normally what happens? Adenoid acts as a part of immune system. Whatever challenges we are facing, Ultimately, all those environmental challenges, microbes, allergens are expelled in the nasopharynx. And adenoid is composed of B cells, basically lymphocytes. It is stimulated, IgA is secreted and to combat all those challenges and to get hypertrophy. So adenoid hypertrophy has crypts which can harbor the biofilms because of the repeated infections. And these biofilms keep on releasing the bacteria to give persistent sinusitis. And it has been proven the same biofilm bacteria found in the sinuses of the children. You remove the biofilm, remove the adenoid, the sinusitis resolves. That's how the concept of adenoidectomy has come in for the treatment of sinusitis in pediatric patients. And it is most effective in children below 6-7 years because the adenoids are more prominent, giving additional blockage. After the 6-7 years, the adenoid side is, you know, the progress of the adenoid is reduced and the size of the nasopharynx increases. So the adenoids are less responsible for biofilms after that age. So this adenoidectomy is more effective in young children for the pediatric sinusitis. Sure. I, I will show you one of the, uh, you know, uh, CT scan in a recent patient. Say this. Uh. See this, this is a probably four-year-old child. See this, massive sinusitis. Massive sinusitis, how can you treat, how can you do sinus surgery in such a young child with such narrow spaces? You have to do all possible means of treatment you have to try to avoid sinus surgery. But operating on such a young child and expecting post-operative douching treatment is not practical. And chances of giving complications are more. And this chil these children, see this? See the adenoids. Look at the adenoids. Adenoids are not very enlarged but are responsible to give sinusitis because of the biofilms. It is not the obstruction of the adenoid, the volume of the adenoid which is responsible to give sinusitis. It is the biofilms which are responsible for giving sinusitis in children. So young children, 
we should not overlook generally what happened this remains overlooked because in young children we rarely get ct scan done to keep your done adenoid acme child is coming back with the same symptoms the nose is blocked the same you know congestion same sneezing same you know uh, watering everything is continuing because the sinus is not scanned and the pediatric sinusitis is overlooked this is one of the endotype which most often remains overlooked looking at the pediatric age of the patient Sir, sorry, this yes. patient. Sir, uh, do you do eustachian tube dilatation in any of your cases? Pardon? Eustachian tube dilatation nowadays. Uh, eustachian tube dilatation. Eustachian tube dilatation. See this another patient. This is another three-year-old patient. See this. Look at the kind of sinusitis. Now this patient, we treated with a adenoidectomy and. Maxillary sinus washout, enteral washout, because other sinuses are not so bad. And this was pure purulence in the maxillary sinus. Three-year-old child. So this was treated along with adenoidectomy, this enteral washout, which gave us a material for the culture sensitivity also. And these are classic. This patient is doing well. So okay. you have to choose patient. You have to get CT scan done in the deserving pediatric patient, which are not getting, you know, improvement with a simple medical treatment. You have to be very, very suspicious in pediatric patients because they are immunodeficiency is quite prevalent in pediatric age group. Allergy is quite prevalent. Recurrent LRTI, URTI are more prevalent in pediatric age group. And the sinusitis is overlooked and that's why they don't get cured. The second part of the question was? Sir, post in cases sir, of uh, patients... Post up, uh, post up, uh, uh, Pictures of this patient after performing most of we didn't get a CT scan done. Yes, madam. So in some cases where the patients have chronic rhinosinusitis, have adenoids, do you do eustachian tube dilatation? Yeah, eustachian tube problems are very common. See, we never done, uh, we have never done eustachian tube dilatation. That's a mechanical dilatation of the eustachian tube. You know what happens? How the eustachian tube is affected in these children or in all these patients? with uh, CRS and the ear problem. See the mucosa of the paranasal sinus and nasal cavity, eustachian tube and middle ear is same. The same inflammatory process which has started in nose and paranasal sinuses extend to involve the eustachian tube and uh, ear. The inflammation in the eustachian tube mucosa cannot be treated mechanically with the dilatation. This is a joke. So that dilatation is required for other reasons, all fibrotic, other block eustachian tubes, for long-standing regions, other regions. For such regions, because of the CRS, it is the inflammatory process which is extended to involve. That's a medical disease which is involved the same mucosa lining the eustachian tube. What the dilatation is going to do in these patients? There is no question of any, uh, you know, thinking of dilatation for these patients. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. See, removal of the turbinate is always a uh, matter of debate. Removal doesn't mean complete removal for that matter. Nobody removes the turbinate completely. Partial removal is indicated. Like for us, I'll show you in a couple of cases in the live surgery, middle turbinate has to be treated differently in inferior turbinate. Both are different tissues altogether. Inferior turbinate has a different role of humidification and like AC for the nose. Inferior turbinate is like AC. And it has vascular stroma with a lot of glandular tissue which is acting as a humidifier. And this turbinate hypertrophy is of two types. One is bony hypertrophy, one is glandular hypertrophy. For bony hypertrophy, we do a partial resection. Partial resection means, I will show in one of the case, with leaving minimal raw area and most of the turbinate is there. Only the part which is hypertrophic blocking the airway has to be excised without giving any problem. Not complete turbinectomy. Complete turbinectomy is uh, something which is going to give symptoms to the patient in many ways in terms of dryness, in terms of, you know, a lack of temperature control and so many other issues. In, in middle, uh, for the glandular hypertrophy, 
we never do a partial turbinectomy, we do a posterior nasal neurectomy, which takes care of that. For middle turbinate is a different tissue that is not erectile tissue like uh, inferior turbinate. And indications of middle turbinating are different in CRS patient. We have some patient where I'm going to show you there are many ways to deal with the turbinate. The concept of partial turbinate resection has come up in a big way and it is beneficial in certain situations. Complete turbinectomy is never done as part of the upper part of the turbinate is always left for identification of the turbinate as well as skull base and frontal ostium as a something to keep you oriented all the time. But the inferior part of the turbinate sometimes is a problem and has to be, you know, resected. Planned resection, in spite of that, the turbinate is not, you know, a mobile or something. It has to be resected for reasons, for two reasons for us. One is when you have a disease medial to the middle turbinate, you have sometimes massive polyposis medial to the middle turbinate, which is, you know, uh, obstructed the path and the turbinate itself becomes an obstruction. In those cases, for our topical to be introduced later on, we do a partial turbinectomy and remove those polyps from that region, only in the lower part. And second, in all olfactory patients who present with a significant olfactory loss, and disease medial to the middle turbinate. For your topicals to go effectively to the olfactory region, you have to remove partly a lower part of the turbinate. So these are the two indications for partial planned turbinate resection. We have a case where we have polyps medial to the turbinate. If you don't resect the turbinate, you can't clear the disease. You can't ensure the topicals going there. And you have to do a partial resection. And now in a massive eosinophilic disease, which requires long-term steroids, it is always advisable whether required or not to do a partial resection for your you know, steroid to reach effectively. So that's a planned partial resection, which is advantageous. Sir, uh, what are the pre-op uh, preparation for doing face surgery? What are the medications and is there any role of uh, using uh, intra, uh, intravenous transgenic acid for control of bleed? I can't hear. There is so much of echoing properly. Uh, what is, uh, what is your uh, protocol for uh, pre-op preparation before for face surgery? Application of? Pre-op preparation. Pre-op preparation? Yes, sir. So that we'll discuss in the uh, case. But yes, to answer this, pre-op preparation is required to reduce the inflammation, to reduce the overall bleeding. And that is achieved by various means. Like all polypoidal disease patients have a high inflammatory load. Their mucosa is highly inflammatory, highly vascular. And to prevent the bleeding, too much of bleeding, you have to start steroids two days before. That is pre-operative preparation. Same thing has to be done intraoperatively to decongest the vessels, to facilitate the venous drainage, to reduce the cardiac output. So many things are to be done together. We'll discuss in OT to reduce the inflammation, to reduce the bleeding. Because the single most factor responsible for the complication is the lack of orientation. If there is too much of bleeding, there will be lack of identification of the landmarks and chances of complications are high. Because this is the surgery of landmark. Even a some millimeter disorientation can lead to disaster. So you have to be very careful. The field should be very, very good to keep your every step under vision, completely oriented. Can you take mic? What? Or the face. Yes, so that is the decision making you have to share with the patient. Because your question is right, that's what we are discussing. As a safety profile, we have only think preoperatively as a weapon. Biggest weapon is a topical steroid. Now, if your inflammatory load is too much to be taken by topical steroid, you have to take a call for surgery. So, or you can give in between course of systemic steroids to reduce the inflammation. Now, if the need of the systemic steroid is again and again, is the indication for surgery. So, somewhere you have to define that your inflammatory load is too much, which is not to which is not being tackled by the medical treatment and the surgery, the needs to, to, so as to avoid the oral steroid again, 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 and again. Uh, 
sir sometimes the uh, symptoms disappear sir using after using steroids but after we stop the steroids again the symptoms comes back yes. so sir so the inflammation inflammation is too much and that is the indication for surgery that's why i said leaving aside everything any patient requiring oral steroid to control their symptom twice in 3 months is a strong indication for surgery there is no point in giving steroids again and again those are the candidates who have high inflammatory profile operate them the role of surgery is to give ability for the topical steroid to penetrate sir and the dose of clarithromycin and for how long we have to use clarithromycin in crs dose of clarithromycin 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 yeah somebody had asked, uh, asked me there also clarithromycin to be used not in an antibiotic it is to be used as an immunomodulator so low doses of clarithromycin for its immunomodulatory action on the entire inflammatory pathway has to be given for long term mostly we use clarithromycin but the safety profile of clarithromycin is sometime not permitting for many of the patient because clarithromycin is digested in the liver by the cytochrome p450 pathway and there are a lot of drug interaction with lot of drugs so in elderly patient it doesn't allow or physician doesn't allow the clarithromycin to be used for them the azithromycin is very safe it is not metabolized by the same p450 pathway so azithromycin is the least drug interaction but the most suited is the clarithromycin overall as a safety profile and efficacy and all that but certain times azithromycin when azithromycin is given see for these macrolides these are the only drugs which have as compared to the serum they have more than 100 times tissue concentration that's why long term low dose azithromycin accumulate in the tissues the clarithromycin macrolides accumulate in tissues and exert a lot of these uh, immunomodulatory effects azithromycin uh, clarithromycin is to be given in 250 mg once a day or minimum 4 months sometimes 6 months whatever azithromycin is to be given 250 mg three times in a week something like that and so according to the situation you can choose any out of them uh um, so you said that you wait for eight weeks uh, while giving topical corticosteroids uh, but the european position paper on this is uh, slightly differing that 2020 yes there are two position paper yeah, 2012 2012 epos 20 yes 20 so this is according to uh, 20 see i tell you the epos 12 was uh, epos 12 mentions ucla guidelines yes yes and according to th that you can uh, give for 8 weeks yes the epos 20 european position paper has different opinion so there is no time limit now you have to involve the patient in decision making if the patient is happy with taking with the oral uh, topical steroid without any symptoms what is the uh, um, you know why to hurry for the surgery yes sir so there is no time limit like that if the that is our goal if the inflammatory profile is not that severe and patient is having controlling symptom with a topical steroid only what is the need for sinus surgery why to rush for sinus surgery yes if he needs oral steroid again or not able to control his symptoms on topical then you have to think of it so there is no as such time limits sir is there any role of uh, intra venous transduing acid before surgery or what intra during surgery intra venous transduing acid what tranexamic acid for the control of bleeding yes sir yeah lots of paper advising after induction a dose of tranexamic acid 1 g tranexamic acid to reduce the bleeding it is actually an anti fibrinolytic agent it is believed to you know reduce the bleeding it reduces obviously being anti fibrinolytic it reduces bleeding for many other you know surgeries but in sinus surgery the source of bleeding is capillaries and you get the same field by means of pre operative and intra operative preparation without any additional need of such systemic therapies it has been you know 
uh, studies quite extensively when the patient was given tranexamic acid and not given tranexamic acid along with the full preparation with hardly any difference. Yes, it has a role. I, I don't doubt about it. But the question is the need. Why to give any additional systemic therapy once you get the same additional field uh, with this? Yes, it is more effective in skull-based situations when you expect more bleeding or more extensive surgeries. But not in sinus surgery. Okay, thank you, sir. So last 15 minutes before we end this session at 1.30, what I was coming to the role of CT scan before we start the surgical session. So quickly in 10 minutes, I'll just uh, touch upon certain issues. How to look at the CT scan, what all we expect from the CT scan. Yes. And what kind of CT scan to be ordered. See, CT scan's role, we discussed the entire session but hardly anything about the CT scan for the decision making. So CT scan has no role in decision making for surgery or no surgery. Once it comes to surgery, then comes the role of CT scan. Because it gives us three-dimensional anatomy of the region where we are going to operate. And this region is very critical. You see, this region is critical in terms of close proximity to the skull base and the orbit all the way and lots of neurovascular structures around. So you need to have a full dynamic, some millimetric CT scan giving us three-dimensional dynamic imaging. If you give me a single plate of CT scan is of no use. That cannot help avoiding complications. That cannot give you complete information. So what CT scan we order, we advise, is a 0.5 mm CT scan in diform format. And then using this software, you can reconstruct. And that's an amazing teaching tool for your institution, for your own, where you can relate each and every structures 3D from the CT scan. So any structure you can see from this plane, what exactly, how it refers to the other plane, how certain anatomy is best seen on coronal plane, certain anatomy on axial, and certain structures best delineated in the sagittal plane like frontal sinus. So you need a three-dimensional imaging of the entire field in the dynamic format. I will give you a certain example why this dynamic format is important. And this is very, very important in the frontal sinus for complete clearance, desired clearance. You know, the biggest problem in the frontal sinus disease, frontal sinus, as compared to the sphenoid and other sinus, is relatively safe away from the critical structures, except medially skull base. Where you stay laterally, you can avoid the skull base injury. But the biggest problem in the frontal sinus is the residual disease and the scarring a surgeon leaves. Frontal sinus has lots of variable cells in the frontal recess, in the frontal drainage pathway. Looking at the CT scan, you need to clear each and every cell and widen the pathway. Otherwise, any kind of scarring or new astenosis or raw area you leave behind or cellular septation you leave behind, Demanding a revision surgery is most challenging. Then you need to really go to a more extensive procedure, a drop or some other procedure later on to tackle those challenging situations. So CT scan gives you a clear concept of the cells in those regions which you need to clear. Three-dimensional anatomy. Any For any structure, you can see dynamically rather than a static. For example, this is your, this is your uncinate process. If you really want to see where the uncinate is going, see this. How the uncinate is going up, up, up. This is this is merging with the agonagy here, merging with the agonagy here and inserting on the orbit, giving a medial drainage pathway for the frontal sinus. Uncinate going medially, going to the skull base to the terminate, giving a lateral pathway is a different one, and this is very important to prevent complication at the beginning. So every structures it will for every structure it will give you dynamic pathology. You can see axial coronal sagittal in all planes. Like for example, this particular patient has an agonagy cell here. See this agonagy? That's the beak. And this is the frontal sinus and this is the drainage pathway. Now this frontal drainage pathway is somewhere between this is the this is the bulla, suprabullar cell behind and this agonagy anterior. This in between is the frontal drainage pathway. This is an example. So looking at the cellularity in the frontal recess, you have to tailor your therapy. 
you will see in all life surgery cases, every case has a different, some or other different anatomy which has to be picked up by CT scan and accordingly address. If I have agar cell, now I know I have to go behind it and fracture it out anteriorly. I see where my beak is. See, this is a beak and this is the frontal sinus. The obstacle to the frontal sinus is this beak. You are coming with the endoscope 70 degrees. You have to go literally far anteriorly and up for the frontal sinus to address. So the configuration of the beak is the one which is the limiting factor to address the deep frontal sinus pathology. Tomorrow, you have a type 4 cell, a big type 4 cell which requires a draft to, to address because the cell is rising high up to the height of the frontal sinus. You cannot go beyond that cell to take a lid down. You need a good exposure as requires a draft to. So lots of draft modifications are, you know, uh, available to address and CT scan will guide you what kind of treatment is required. This is important for the patient counseling as well. Sometimes you take up the patient for the sinus surgery and ultimately you realize that it will be converted to a draft. And telling patient to convert to a draft more invasive procedure which might incur extra cost, extra time, extra lot of things, you know, uh, and sometimes it is not, you know, acceptable to the patient. So you have to be, your CT scan is a guiding force in those situations. So in CT scan, you can see each and every anatomy we'll discuss in detail, not here now, which are, uh, you know, important for the patients in every different, different, you know, case. Here, I'll give you some examples to simplify and to know that how important a CT scan is. See this. This was a patient. I am giving some examples of the allergic fungal sinusitis. We have already discussed what is allergic fungal sinusitis. Hmm. Allergic fungal sinusitis, we have seen where the fungus is an antigen. This particular patient, see this. See where the fungus is. We have a similar patient. This patient presented with blindness. See this? This is the lesser wing of the sphenoid. That is the optic nerve. And this is the inflammation which is spread to the optic nerve. This can involve the optic nerve by both the means, by pressure or by inflammation, spread of inflammation presented with blindness. And these are the patients who have a best prognosis. CT will tell you the dissense of the surrounding structures. For frontal sinus, it will tell you how the frontal sinus, see the disease in the frontal sinus, expanded. Allergic fungal sinusitis expands. See the dura is absent all over. The roof dura is absent and the disease is extending up and up because this material is not able to clear out. It is expanding more and more eosinophil is around the fungus and this kind of dehiscence all around the bone, you know, orbit all around the skull base. So CT will warn you to handle such extensive problems, warn you of bony defects, and a dynamic CT scan will give you a complete three-dimensional picture of all around. You can exactly see where the bony defects are, see the sagittal section, so that you are more careful in those regions. So, in allergic fungal sinusitis, most of the time, you will find such bone, you know, defects, and you have to be very careful in those situations. Now, see this. This example... It's a very important example and this cannot be picked up without a dynamic CT scan. And if you overlook, one cannot do a complete job to clear this pathology. See this patient. See this patient, frontal sinus, unilateral frontal sinus disease. See the value of dynamic imaging. Frontal sinus disease, anteriorly frontal sinus coming behind, behind the beak. All those frontal cells are anteriorly placed, close to the beak. Now I'm going behind, 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 and now a cell appears. Cell appears in the frontal drainage pathway. The frontal sinus drain from behind. So, so posterior cell 
looking like a type 4 cell cannot be type 4. And see the location of the cell where the entire frontal sinus is going, sinus is going to drain. Now, how can you identify what kind of cell is this? Reconstruct. Sagittal. See this? Let's pick up the cell in the coronal. This was the cell. And look at the sagittal. Look at the sagittal, this cell. This is the frontobular cell coming from behind. Frontobular cell. See this frontobular cell extending into the frontal sinus, blocking almost completely the frontal drainage pathway from behind. Now, if somebody assumes it as a type 3 cell, where the treatment is to go behind and bring the cell out. If you try to go behind cell, you will breach the skull base. Now with the CT scan, dynamic and three-dimensional, now we know each and every place of each and every septation. Now we know our pathway. This is the narrowed frontal drainage pathway. You need to, you know, go along the beak. You go into the frontal pathway. Open up this cell by, by taking up this septation and flush with the skull base. So this is frontobular cell. This is the cell which is behind, attached to the skull base. And accordingly, you have to treat it. Had this been a type 3 cell, we would come, type 3 cell would have been attached anteriorly and then we would have to go behind it and bring it out. So the good dynamic CT scan exactly tell you what kind of a cell. A single printout cannot give you this kind of information. And ultimately, what happened, the frontal sinus is already considered a single printout with any kind of these cells. And once you an endoscope, everything looks like frontal sinus. All cells look like frontal sinus and ultimately end up doing an incomplete job, needing a revision surgery, which is 1,000 times challenging in frontal sinus than a primary surgery. So CT scan can prevent you from such a major problem if you understand those cells very clearly. One of the patients we have uh, uh, kept in the list probably today evening or tomorrow is one of the problems which, if you understand this CT scan, can be tackled so easily, otherwise it is most difficult to treat. Believe me, even the open surgery cannot treat this problem. Let me show you. There is no open surgery can answer this problem except endoscopic with some orbital transposition. Look at this, allergic fungal sinusitis. See this frontal recess on this side. This frontal recess is so narrowed, completely blocked, which has blocked the drainage of the frontal sinus into the frontal recess and the orbital bone is destroyed and the content is prolapsing into the orbit. Now, how can you address? If you try to address it by the external approach, you cannot communicate with the frontal recess because see, it is already so narrowed by this bone. This superior medial bone of the orbit is the biggest obstacle. This is the obstacle. See, this has narrowed the drainage pathway. And this has burst lateral to it into the roof of the orbit. Now, how to address? Even if you address by the open approach, you cannot communicate the drainage pathway. And again, it is going to come back. It is not the removal of the mucosa which is important. It is the establishment of a drainage pathway to prevent future problems. And in order to deal with these problems, these are the classical cases. I have kept one of the cases in the list which require orbital transposition. Orbital transposition is what? This superior medial wall of the orbit is responsible for narrowing this drainage. And in those situations, you have to remove this superior medial wall. You, remove, you have to remove this bone, complete bone, separating the periorbita away. No. Separate the periorbita away, punch out the bone. And widen this drainage pathway into the nasal cavity. That's the answer. That is called orbital transposition laterally. And that's the only answer uh, for such patient. Another example. See this. Because this laterally trapped mucosil. This is a mucosil which is laterally trapped. The same, same patient. Look at the MRI. See this. This is the frontal sinus disease. That's the frontal sinus disease. This is the bone which has narrowed the pathway, narrowed the drainage pathway. These are the polyp. And see, this lateral sinus is drawn, not draining, leading to a mucosil which is pushing and giving proptosis by means of, you know, 
uh, taking away the flow roof of the uh, orbit and giving proptosis. Now, for such problems, unless you don't establish this drainage pathway, removal of this mucosal is never going to work. You operate any number of times, it is going to come back. So, you need to communicate. You need to communicate this with this drainage pathway to prevent problems in the future. And that is possible only by removing this superior medial part of the orbital wall. And then you can give a wide drainage pathway to the lateral most part of the uh, frontal sinus. So, CT scan or the imaging will guide you exactly that what kind of a, you know, surgical treatment is required for particular patients. Accordingly, you can, you know, counsel your patient to dictate the kind of particular uh, treatment. Now, another example. Yes, yes, Pawan, please. Yes. Hmm. See, you are obliterating the lateral part, but still not communicating with the medial part. And you never know where again the mucosa is trapped. Again, the mucosa is trapped because the medial limit is not defined. You only obliterate. Now, medial limit, whatever you left, you are never sure it is going to be aerated. So, this is going to come back. So, that, that cannot communicate. You have to ensure each and every bit of mucosa removal until that part which is communicating. If that communicating, that, is not, that doesn't require a mucosa removal. But the part which you are obliterating has to be completely segregated from the drainage part. That is impossible. That to is remove each sure. and every that bit of mucosa. Zero. Uh, and it is going you to have come to back. even drill. You have to even drill whatever the bony margins. And Question then is operate. the remaining mucosa. Question is remaining mucosa because the uh, it is it might be a good theory. But yeah. if you talk about a localized mucosal there, which is going superiorly or superolaterally to the orbit, yeah, I think uh, orbital transposition for a mucosal which can I'll carry, show you again. I, I'm not done, boss. Uh, to deal with that is looks like an overkill to me. So what? you what you can do is this is external... simple. We have a case I'll show you. This is the simplest lifetime answer to it. Without breaching into the orbit, without going into the orbit and establishing natural drainage pathway to the far lateral area. That is completely physiological. See this, what you are saying. If you remove this mucosal only and obliterate it, we have to establish this rest of the drainage pathway. Now, until now, wherever you obliterate, the rest of the pathway should be communicated to the nose. If this end point is not communicated, it is again going to give the same problem. You cannot count each and every mucosa. So, the answer is has to be physiological to completely communicate forever. And this is orbital transposition. This is the final answer we have done in so many patients. And they do so well. You don't need to go external. You don't need to, you know, uh, be uh, uh, thinking of the revision or need of revision or any problem in the future. Just do and make it physiological once forever. That is the final answer to these patients. Now, what I was saying, this is another problem. See, we have a case also for this large intersinus septal cell. See this. Look at the CT scan. Where is the frontal sinus? This big, this big is the intersinus septal cell. This is the beak. This big is the intersinus septal cell. And these two are the frontal sinuses. Now going behind, see this. Going behind. This is the intersinus septal cell, which has replaced most of the frontal sinus. And these are two small frontal sinuses laterally, which now are communicating to the frontal recess. And this cell, this cell is actually communicating to the left side frontal sinus. So intersinus septal cell communicate on either side with one of the frontal sinus. And you need to see on dynamic imaging which side it is connecting and you remove the party wall and your problem is over. You remove this party wall between the intersinus septal cell and the frontal sinus and the problem is over. And that is so well defined on dynamic imaging. See this, the huge, 
the inter sinus septal cell is you know five times bigger than the frontal sinus and the frontal sinus is laterally placed. So what kind of cell, whether it is frontobulla type 3, because the frontal sinus cellularity in the frontal drainage pathway is so variable. So it can be best defined on dynamic imaging like this. And this is the way you need to look at the frontal sinus. We will see case by case, every case, what kind of uh, you know uh, important finding is there. Accordingly, we will discuss that. Before we leave, any questions, anybody? Because 2 o'clock, we are um, in half an hour's time, we are starting a surgical session. Yes, sir. Transorbital. Uh -huh. That is not transorbital. Yeah. So, yeah. See, you can make ports any. But how will you ensure the drainage? Question is the future drainage. Well, you have done, you have done obliterated, you have removed whatever. But how will you ensure the remaining frontal drainage? So answer should be physiological, not removing anything. It has a mucosal, it has a mucosa inside. You have to communicate with the you know, nasal cavity. So this requires orbital. We have a case, we'll show you how this orbital transposition can be done very easily. It's not difficult, but it requires a proper surgery to give a physiological answer. Yes, Shailesh. Uh, yes, please. Is there any role of uh, combined approach, like endoscopic and external? Or yes, That's what Pawan was talking. Yes. So, orbital transposition will take care of the far, furthermost laterally placed mucosils for yes, drainage? Anything. See, when the sinus surgery was introduced, the earlier concept was if the disease is beyond the mid-orbital plane, laterally, is a contraindication to endoscopic approach. Now in the era, this era, we can reach any pathology. We have done several times, even the disease reaching far laterally, even to the terion. There are ways to do it. Orbital transposition is the simplest way to reach to the lateral part. If you have to go beyond, you can do a modified hemilothrops. Modified hemilothrops is what? Do a shaft two on the same side. Yeah. Then a nasal septotomy. And coming from the opposite node with the angle endoscope far laterally to give you access far laterally to the same side. So to reach the far laterally on the same side, you come from the opposite side. By a septotomy and draft two. So that gives you, that is modified hemilothrops. So there are many ways to go far laterally. There is no contraindication for any lateral most pathology in the frontal sinus for endoscopy. Yeah, one more situation. If there is an anterior table and a posterior table distortion by the mucosal and the meningeal enhancement, still and you and meningeal the? enhancement, pachymeningitis of the okay. frontal dura. So still you prefer to do endoscopic. Okay. That is the best answer. And or how not to only reconstruct that. the defects or you any just pathology. leave it like that. Any pathology, any even benign tumor, any CSF leak. Because it's a matter of exposure which was limiting. Now with the lots of draft and their variations, you can expose to any level. So is there any need of reconstruction after no you need. do orbital transposition? That is the biggest or advantage by like that is the biggest advantage by endoscopy because you are communicating for the drainage. You don't need any reconstruction. If you are obliterating, if you are doing something non-drainage, then you have to reconstruct. Once you are communicating with the drainage, you don't need any reconstruction. Thank you. Hello, sir. Uh, question regarding entrocornal polyp. Entrocornal polyp. Sir. In spite of being removal after visualization of cavity with 70 degree scope, still we can find in particular early age group that it recurs. AC polyp recurrence. Yeah, AC polyp is a different pathology. This is not like uh, uh, these polyps. Their etiology is still, there are so many theories proposed. But the most acceptable is a negative pressure lymphedema theory. Because it comes out of the accessory ostium because of the negative pressure in the nose. And because of the lymphedema in the base. So, AC polyp can recur. In spite of the big, uh, you know, middle metal antrostomy, establishing ventilation drainage, it can come back. So it has been proposed to 
coagulate the base of the poly wherever it is attached to to prevent future lymphedema. You can take a canine fossa approach secondary to reach out that area because sometimes the attachment is far lateral, far anteromedial, not accessible by the regular entrostomy. You can take any other approach. Uh, what is the uh, solution used for nasal douching? Irrigation. What is? What are the solution? solution? Yeah, used for. So uh, we'll discuss that tomorrow in the post-operative part. But yes, once you have asked, we use the budenoside solution. Aqueous budenoside makes okay. in saline or ringer lactate and then dues properly in certain positions. Sir, one question. Budenoside, which is yes, generally used for nebulization for asthma. Okay. Respules. Respules. Uh, sir, in, uh, excuse me. Uh, sir, in patients who have allergy, one patient will not develop anything. He will just have plain allergic rhinitis and another patient will develop bilateral polyps. So how is it decided this patient will go this way and other patient develop polyps? See, that, that every patient has a different immunity profile. So every allergic patient is not developing sinusitis. Those allergic is a pro-inflammatory stage because the same cytokines are involved. Now in that pro-inflammatory stage, somebody, somebody has a immune dysfunction, sinonasal immune dysfunction will lead to sinusitis. So ultimately the thing which comes again and again is the immunity. So you have to improve that. And if there is any dysfunction, you have to treat it. Which? Prednisolone. Simple. Though you can use any, all these have relative potency. All are same. Oh. 